Okay, Andy, we're recording. Go ahead. Okay, I'd like to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting to order for May 12, 2022. Um, it's uh, just a couple of minutes after nine o'clock. And the pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting is conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by Zoom and telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is being permitted, but every effort is made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. And um, with that, I would like to uh, go through the Finance Committee and uh, make sure that uh, everybody is present um, and sort of for those who are present, uh, sure that we can hear you and you can hear us. So I was doing an alphabetical order um, through the entire committee. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner. I'm here. <clears throat> Matt Halloway. Present. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Michelle Miller. I believe is not on yet. So we'll come back if she joins us, Kathy Shane. Here. And um, Alicia Walker. Not here yet. Is not here yet. Okay. Um, and uh, there is a quorum of the council, is there not? Mm, no, there's only six of us. Okay. But I'd like to make sure that the people who are here can hear us and we can hear them. So Mandy Johanneke. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm sorry. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Pam Rooney. Yes. Okay, so we have three major budgets that we're uh, going to talk about today. And um, I want to give just a quick rundown of approximate times so that uh, because we have to work within limits too. And uh, I appreciate the fact that our superintendent and the uh, finance director of the schools and the chair of the school committee are all present too. And uh, so um, that schools are the first uh, item that we will consider. Libraries will be second and the recreation department will be third. And um, I will try and monitor time that we're allocating to each. Um, and also recognize that our town manager um, and finance director for the town of Amherst um, are also present on for this meeting. So uh, that said, um, I would uh, welcome, I want to welcome the uh, superintendent and uh, the chair of the committee and uh, Dr. Slaughter. And uh, maybe I'll turn it to uh, Dr. Morris first. And we have a plan for each of these meetings, uh, each of these presentations, where we want to start with a five or 10 minute um, presentation of sort of an overview of the budget. Um, no, uh, that's the maximum time we don't you know, have to go for that amount of time, but we want to uh, allow each um, presenter of a budget to um, frame the budget first for the committee. So, um, Andy, we now have a quorum. Michelle Miller has joined us. So, why okay, don't I actually, but let me pause. Um, for the purposes of this committee, Michelle, can you hear and um, hear us? And yes, I'm here. Okay, and then I have to turn it back over to Lynn because there's now a quorum of the council. This was also posted as a council meeting in case a quorum did come. And so, uh, President Griesmer? Given, given that we have a quorum of the town council present, I'm going to call the town council uh, to order at 9.08. 
and we have already checked with all of the other people who are here. So let's proceed. Okay, so thank you. So Dr. Morris, back to you. Sure, I'll be quite brief and I'll, I'll turn it on to Dr. Slaughter and perhaps uh, Ms. McDonald if she has some uh, comments to share. I'm aware that there's other uh, items on your agenda other than the schools today. So we'll, we'll again, we'll try to be as brief and concise as we can. Uh, so uh, the, the short story for our budget this year is our school committee requested that we attempt to maintain a level services budget uh, and maintain ESSER, which is um, the federal stimulus fund um, that went directly to schools, maintain ESSER fund uh, usage uh, moving forward. And you know we believe the budget we brought forward achieved those ends. Uh, the original budget that we brought forward had no additions or no reductions in it. Uh, it did use a, a healthy amount of ESSER, but uh, we're looking through projections for next year, we do believe that we would have uh, ESSER funds for one more fiscal year and we'd have sufficient funds uh, to be able to uh, do the things that we need to do uh, for the next fiscal year beyond maintain our staffing and, and other service deliveries. So we were able to achieve that. Um, I think as Allison may, may talk about, there was a request from the school committee to restore uh, prior uh, a cut of prior positions that certainly would benefit our students and community. And uh, I'll let her speak to that in a, in a bit, but just wanting to know the priorities that I received, that we received from the school committee were again, uh, twofold, uh, maintain our level of staffing and support, given the challenges that students had uh, at this point in the pandemic and uh, particularly at the elementary level, uh, not having school for a bit over a year uh, from an academic as well as social emotional level uh, was something that, that we all agreed was incredibly important to move forward. These, the, the challenges that we received are not gonna resolve uh, in a fiscal year uh, for our students or our families or community. And so I think at this point, um, I'm not sure whether Allison or Doug uh, would like to jump in, but I'll pass it on to one of those two. Sorry, we have, we, this is not a uh, well-oiled machine. We did not meet beforehand to, to map this out, these five or 10 minutes uh, to maybe speak to a little more detail on the budget. Um, I, was, I was thinking maybe going to Allison, if you wanted to jump in a little bit from the school committee perspective and then to Doug, if that's, I know it's a little bit of an atypical order, but I think in this case, it, it might make sense. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I, I think as, as Dr. Morris mentioned, the um, school committee early on in the budget process, um, so last fall, um, expressed the strong um, and I would say unified direction that we did not want to be making cuts to our ongoing, our current programs and services in our schools at this point in time. Our students are still recovering from, from pandemic. Our staff is still struggling with, um, with, with that. Um, and so this is not the time for us to be um, making cuts to our services. Um, the other, uh, I, I think, background in there is that we've been making cuts um, for, I want to say, for the last five or six years at least. Um, I, the data that I have goes back to FY17 um, to meet budget guidance. So I, I think you know, the, the conversation that we've had um, throughout the whole budget processes at, at the Amherst School Committee was not a light one. And we did not take this um, approach um, and our request lightly um, and, and struggled with figuring out um, how, how to manage the, the funding and the request um, to the town. We did um, meet with the budget coordinating group at the beginning of the budget season and express that significant concern um, at, at, with the budget guidance. So um, I, I would say this has been a consistent um, concern of ours since the very beginning. Um, one of the things uh, that we talked about, we are using, as Dr. Morris mentioned, and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Slaughter will go into in detail, is we are using significant ESSER funds to support the budget because the school committee was not willing to make um, cuts to our current services. Um, and I should note, current services does not mean flat spending. It does not mean level spending. Current services and current programs means exactly the same programming that we're providing. Um, and as you all are very familiar with, it cost inflation happens every year. Um, some contracted and some um, just natural cost inflation. So that doesn't mean a level budget. And um, when we looked at, uh, when uh, Doug and Mike um, came to the school committee, that increase just to maintain level services was an increase of 1.1 million over our, um, this year's budget or 60% more than what the town guidance was, was providing. In using the ESSER funding, um, 
uh, to support that budget and folding in, as Dr. Morris mentioned, some of the requests, um, strong requests um, and advocacy that we received from the community. Um, we're requesting an increase of 717,000 as compared to the 665,000 that was in the budget guidance. So a 2.9% increase as compared to a 2.7% increase. We also know that um, movement at, at, the, at the state level um, on, the, on the budget suggests that um, the funding that this, the town will be receiving from the state for education, specifically chapter 70 aid based on student population, um, is going to be at least 32,000 higher than what was um, projected in the budget as revenue. We also know that through the hard work of the, um, the finance office and the HR team at, in the district, um, putting together requests for reimbursement for COVID related sick time to the state, we're receiving, the town is going to be receiving also an additional approximately $32,000. So together that's over $62,000, $63,000 that it will be going to the town thanks to the efforts of the school district staff and um, the chapter 70 aid. Um, so the school committee is asking that a portion of that be directed to the schools to support this year's budget request. And with that, I'll turn it over to Doug to go into details. Thank you, Allison. Um, <clears throat> so as she, as she stated, we're, we're looking at a, a level services budget and trying to fund that with, with the resources we have available to us. Uh, a few of the things to note relative to, to this budget is that uh, we have uh, six contracts with unions, two are settled, four are not. Uh, we're still negotiations on those. And so the, for those that are, are not settled, uh, we're you know, making an estimate of what we think will, will be an appropriate amount of, of funding to uh, accommodate the, the settlement uh, agreement associated with that. Um, you know, we projected forward what people's, uh, in, in, for those that are familiar or not familiar, we have step increases if people are not at the top steps with this a grade and step salary schedule. So it's a grid um, and people tend to progress through that, those steps as they as mature in their career with us. Um, so we've taken into account the steps which uh, have, you know, significantly increases on a per personal level for, for salary, but then we do an overarching, uh, typically an overarching cost of living increase. That's the part that we're, we're negotiating at present with our, with our unions. And so we've made estimates of what we think that will be. And that is in our, our sort of control accounts or contingency funds. Uh, so if you're looking at the, at the budget summary, that's where we sort of put that, that estimate of, of what we have. Um, and that's still to be determined. Um, I think in general, you know, we're looking at uh, a higher use of, of, of uh, school choice um, resources, which which we typically apply in our regular education uh, salary area, and so that makes it even though the staffing looks the same there, the the uh, cost seems to go down. Um, sometimes staff turnover causes that, but but more often in in this particular case, if you look at the last couple of years, we've used progressively more school choice. We have it available to us, and so we're going to use it. Uh, it doesn't do us any good to sit on it for long periods of time, and so we're going to utilize some of that funding and still have a healthy balance relative to that, but that looks that makes our regular education salary expense look lower than maybe it, it, it might otherwise uh, because we've got support from outside sources. Um, <clears throat> but I think that, you know, in, in the main, you know, most of the sort of regular expenses we're trying to keep at, at regular sort of levels uh, and, and anticipate increases in costs uh, relative to inflation that we're seeing. So, you know, our utilities and our, our uh, expenses uh, for material goods and those sort of things. Are, we're trying to anticipate those in, in this budget as well. And, and we'll likely, given what we estimated and what re the reality is on the ground, uh, we'll be very cautious with our spending through next year because I think if inflation holds as it has the last couple of months, uh, we've not estimated it as aggressively in that area as, as the reality is. And so we'll have to be conscientious of that as we work through our budget uh, year in fiscal 23. Um, <clears throat> um, other than that, I think that you know the 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 uh, the, the the budget in Maine is is sort of as as we said level services. So we're looking to to kind of continue to do what we're going to do uh, and are doing this year. Um, it does require fairly significant support from our ESSER funds to do that, um, and obviously that'll be our sort of resource of last resort. If there are economies in other places, we'll use less of that as the year goes on. Uh, we certainly recognize that's one time money, and as we get into fiscal. 24, 25, et cetera, we'll, we'll have to find ways to, uh, to meet that need. Um, 
you know, the ESSER funding is in good shape. It will carry us through uh, and it is available for use into, into fiscal 25 a little bit. Um, and so that's helpful to us as far as the time period uh, that we have available to use those funds. Um, but at the same time, you know, if, if we're funding things that are recurring expenses, it will put us in, in uh, and, and cause us to evaluate closely uh, our, our spending in the coming years and, and how we choose to do that and, and how we make up that, that difference. Um, there are some things coming on like sixth grade moving to the, to the, uh, to the middle school that should pro provide some relief. We're still beginning the, the process of evaluating what that, that change involves and what needs it has and, and what savings there might be. Uh, so I think that'll be an evolving picture over the summer and into next year. Um, I think I'll stop there and see if there are other questions. That's a sort of broad painting of the picture um, of where we sit with our budget for the coming year. Yeah, thank you, Doug. And uh, thank you, Allison and uh, Mike. That was a very helpful introduction. Um, I We have one more member of the uh, council and committee who's now present. Um, so I just want to make sure, Alicia that Walker, that you can hear us. And uh, so if you just uh, acknowledge that you heard and we can go on. Make sure you're muted and well, we'll come back to confirm her participation. Lynn, do you have anything that you wanted to add? I, I want to ask you, Andy, as chair, to clarify what we are allowed to do with the school budget and not allowed to do with the school budget. And the second thing is I would like to have a better understanding of two items that Allison brought forward. One is the 32,000 um, in the budget. I assume that is in the recently released Senate budget, but I would like that clarified. And since we don't have a state budget yet. And the other one was how firm is the COVID reimbursement of 32,000? Having said all that, the reason I'm asking this is we start out the budget season with projections. We base projections on percent, on, we then tell people come in with a budget at a certain percentage. What happens if the projections that we used go up providing additional funding in various categories, in this case, the school. And yet we won't know all of that even as we go through our budget discussion and our recommendations. So it's trying to help pull together all the pieces of this puzzle and understand what the council can or cannot do and where the other degrees of flexibility may be down the road in terms of the use of other money that we were not aware of at the time. Sorry. Okay, now that's a, actually a good question, a good introduction. And um, I will attempt to respond to it and also offer town manager and the town finance director an opportunity to um, add to the response. Um, it has been the practice of uh, town, both in our former form of government and um, now that we're a city, that um, we respect the school department as an independent but town funded department and allocate and appropriate funds, but the budget decisions and the educational decisions, the policy decisions belong to a separate elected school committee and the professional staff that they hire so that uh, while we may have questions about how decisions are being made on the allocation of funds, uh, it's important that we have the opportunity to ask those questions. Ultimately, the decision belongs to the school committee and the administrative staff that the school committee hires. Uh, as far as the 
budget process itself is concerned, and then I'll cut to, to the meeting process quickly and uh, see if uh, either Paul or Sean have anything to add. But uh, we start the year by determining the amount of funds and trying to make reasonable allocations. That's a council policy that is established through guidelines that we develop and are approved by the council in December or January and follow guidance that is uh, provided to us. Uh, funds that are received in total, uh, just because there is an increase in an amount, uh, in this case, it was referenced to uh, chapter 70, because there is so much more money that is just being appropriated from appropriated funds. And this is not just about schools. It is about the entire budget process that uh, income that may be received for one particular area does not necessarily flow or belong to that area that uh, we look at all revenue um, is um, revenue that we receive and try not to earmark revenue. We had that discussion actually at the last meeting on a different subject. Uh, and uh, that I think is probably the best introduction I can give. When, I, uh, when we hear from Paul, if he wishes to speak or Sean, if he wishes to speak on this subject, um, we will get into some quest allowing questions, and I will be starting each of these with the Finance Committee has assigned one person to give some um, extra thought to the process. In this case, it was um, Matt Holloway, and so I will call on him first, and then I will recognize other people and try and see how many people there are and limit time for each individual's questions as appropriate. But uh, Paul or uh, Sean, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Paul, Sean, seemed, Sean seemed eager to answer. Very, very eager enough. Um, so a few things. Um, so the town's practice is to always build its budget on the governor's budget because that's the one we have um, You know, when we're going through this process and we're planning long-term. Um, there's always gonna be changes to that or mostly there will usually be changes to that in the House and Senate versions that come after it. Um, but nothing is typically finalized until after the council votes um, the, the town manager's budget. So, so again, for that reason, we don't typically make tweaks to the, to the state aid projections um, after the governor's um, version. Um, and other reasons why we don't do that is because there's, there's estimates in, in the cherry sheet that we get. So the cherry sheet is the projection of state aid that will come to the town. There's a number of estimates that even after the, the budget's voted could change like charter tuition reimbursement and um, choice receipts and things like that, um, that are real time and will continue to change throughout the year. Um, so when you vote a budget in June, you're, you're really voting the expense budget. The revenue budget doesn't really get finalized until the fall when the tax rate is set. That's when we plug in whatever the final state aid is. Um, we look at other receipts, if they've gone up or down, and we, we put together sort of the, the final revenue uh, projection for the year that will support the tax rate. Um, so, so we don't make those tweaks. Um, the Senate budget that just came out, proposal that came out yesterday was even a little bit better, uh, quite a bit better than the House. Um, there's a pretty big disparity between the House and the Senate. Um, there was a, a big increase in unrestricted general government aid in the Senate proposal. Um, so that's gonna have to be reconciled. And I think that's just another reason why we don't make these tweaks because there's a big gap there in predicting where that's gonna go, um, you know, is anybody's guess. Um, the other uh, uh, item that was raised was the um, COVID reimbursement. So both the, the town and the schools uh, offered a benefit or elected to offer a benefit to employees that if they were out with um, certain eligible uh, reasons for COVID, that they wouldn't have to use their own sick time. They that the town would pay it and and charge this program that the state set up. And so we did receive reimbursement from the state for offering this leave. Um, the one thing I'll just caution is that it's a one-time revenue. It's not something we'll get every year. Um, 
it's it's just a, it's a one-time thing and that program has ended. And I think the last thing I'll say is when we look at the budget guidance um, and we set those numbers, you know, we're really trying to think what is sustainable long-term year after year. Um, we know year to year revenues may be a little bit greater, a little bit lower. Um, but if you, you know, ramp up your budget in one year because there's a good year and then the next year goes back to sort of the norm, then we're in this position of having sort of a yo-yo effect of going up and down with our budget. So we do try to think long-term and, and what's sustainable over, you know, five or 10 years as opposed to one year. Okay. Paul, do you have anything to add or, okay. Um, I see a couple of hands up and I uh, want to make sure because uh, as far as the discussion of the budget itself, I really do want to start with uh, Matt because we had a process set up through the committee that we assigned people to do that. Uh, is, uh, if the question is not related to the budget, but is related to the topic that was just discussed about the process as a whole, then keep your hand up. And uh, so, uh, Michelle? My question is just a clarification. What exactly is Chapter 70 funding? What is it set aside? What is it used for? I think I heard Allison say or ask the council to receive for the school committee to receive that money. Um, and I heard what Andy said about earmarking. I'm trying to put all of the pieces together. Um, so if that could be explained a little bit in better detail, I'd appreciate it. Do you want me to start? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so chapter 70 um, is education funding. It go, um, there's a complicated formula, which Doug could probably speak to more that um, or we both could speak to if we wanted to. None of you want to hear it. Um, but there's a very complicated formula that produces what that number is. Um, and so it went up because Amherst is a community that only gets minimum per pupil aid increases each year. Um, we're not a, a community that gets what they call foundational aid increases. Um, essentially, we're getting more than what the formula says we should get. And so instead of them reducing what we get, they just give us a bare minimum increase each year. Um, so between the governor's budget and the house budget, the minimum per pupil increase to chapter 70 was, uh, I think it went from 30 to 60. Is that right, Doug? Um, so the increase for chapter 70 is going up. I think the thing I've said before is um, in terms of school funding and all funding, really, it's a package. We put it all together. Um, the schools receive much uh, far and above the chapter 70. So they, you know, if you were to equate, if you were to look at the funding that go to the schools, chapter 70 is only a portion of what goes to the schools. They, um, I, I can't tell you the exact percentage off the top of my head, but um, I don't know, maybe less than half, Doug, I'm not. So, so there's a lot more funding in addition to chapter 70 that goes to the schools. So when we see increases like that to chapter 70, we don't, it, it wouldn't necessarily just go directly to the schools because it's part of that, that pot that we talk about that gets divvied up to all departments. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Kathy? Mine is just a quick question um, as we are looking at the total budget. Are we looking at a budget that is higher than what's in the town manager's budget? Or are we looking at a budget that's exactly the same because you're using ESSER funds? So I'm looking at the three page document and then I compared it. If you use ESSER funds, we're exactly at it. So I wasn't quite sure what's in front of us when I looked at the two sets of budget documents. So the version that's, um, so there's, there's actually two things in front of the finance committee I would suggest. Um, there's the town manager's budget, which is at the guidelines. Um, and then there is the budget voted by the school committee, which is 50,000, a little, a little north of 50,000 greater than the budget guidelines. And, and Sean, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out where I, I see that because I saw an increase in ESSER funds that brings it, it looked to me like it brings it right to rather than billion fifty over. I it, it's just a question of what 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 am I supposed to be looking at on yeah, the so, total, total line? Um, so Doug or Mike can correct me, but I think so in the attachments that I forwarded to you, there was um, one that showed the original proposal from the superintendent, um, the addition of the um, art uh, the the specialist programs, and then what that would look like if ESSER was 
increase to fund it. And then there's the one that was sort of a standalone summary that was actually, it says at the top voted by school committee. Um, and that shows the budget with those additional positions, but without using ESSER funds, with, with using more town funds to support the budget. I think I'm missing the third one, Sean, the one okay. pager. So it thanks. Be that. All right. Okay. Um, Doug, did you have anything you wanted to add on the general talk we were talking about now? Just quickly to Kathy's point. Um, so uh, what the school committee actually voted was, was uh, for that addition of uh, those specialist folks to be returned to their 1.0 uh, FTE from 0.8. Um, the school committee actually funded a third of it. What they voted was a third of it to be funded from ESSER funds, essentially, and two thirds of it to be funded by town appropriation. So that's where the 52 thousand eight hundred is um and if the if the committee would like i can display that that page that kathy was saying she was missing and sort of show the what the school committee actually voted uh and what what town support's necessary what esser uh support was was uh projected let's hold off for, but thank you and we might come back to that um let's see if we can paul yeah, just to be clear, what the council votes is the bottom line budget. You can't tell the school committee what to put in the budget or whatnot. It's a bottom line, and then the school committee instructs the superintendent what to put into that budget. Um, if you said we are giving you fifty thousand dollars for this particular position, they can abide by that or not. So the council's power or authority stops at the bottom line budget and then it flips to the school committee to make the decision on how to allocate those funds. Thank you. Uh, so let me move it along to Matt and uh, you had been the one who had been point person to sort of do introductory um, questions and had actually, I believe, um, had some conversations with uh, Doug. You want to uh, give us a brief summary of what you have uh, come to and what questions you raised and get us started? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Andy. Um, and, you know, being new member, a new member of the Finance Committee was a little bit daunting to be looking at this elementary school's budget. Um, and not having multiple years of context. And so those are definitely things that I'm very aware of in terms of my limitations. Um, but first of all, I just wanna thank Allison uh, and Doug in particular. They both spent uh, quite a bit of time talking with me about more details within this budget, I think, than you know, truly is within the purview of the Finance Committee, but, but they were very um, gracious and, and generous with their time in terms of unpacking some of the numbers that were in there. And, um, you know, I have just a lot of confidence in, in them as being good stewards of the, the public trust uh, and, and educating our kids. Um, I think for me, coming, coming in a little bit fresh out of the cold, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, the, the biggest sort of concern that I have is uh, making sure that we as a town can move in a, you know, uh, concerted, collaborative fashion on these very major capital projects that we have down the road. Um, and so, you know, having bumps in the road on the elementary school operating budget is not an ideal way to start that. And I, I think we will um, certainly get to the point where we can sort of have a unified message and a unified perspective on funding these um, very major projects. And so, you know, I think, and I'm sure that everybody on the screen right now has that in their, in their mind as well as, you know, a desire for successful outcomes for not only, you know, year over year capital budget, uh, operating budgets, but but making these large um, capital projects a reality. Uh, that's, I think that's the overriding goal here. Um, I did, you know, I, I, like I said, I did really go, go into the operating budget with Doug quite a bit, um, you know, and there, obviously there's kind of this elephant in the room around, uh, you know, a request that, that sort of asks the council to override the town manager's proposed budget. And so, you know, with, with that sort of in the back of my mind, we, we did look closely at the operating budget um, with Doug especially. And um, I think it's you know, safe to say that we op we've certainly identified some areas um, on the expense side that, you know, that might result in a 40, 50, $60,000 you know, savings to kind of come back to that same level that Paul and, and Sean had um, recommended. And 
you know, I mean, the areas that I think folks on this screen are well familiar familiar with, just sort of some of the um, ebb and flow of staffing that happens in a public school district. Um, you know, paraprofessionals that that have a variety of sort of roles, and I, you know, these are things that are very complicated. And, and as people, it's not just it's not just line items on a on a budget, but um, you know, there are certainly a number of areas where um, you know, special education tuitions. Uh, on the expense side, that's a, th those are all just fluctuating things that are not, they don't crystallize easily. And, and we realize that a budget document is just a snapshot. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say, and, and I, Doug, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you know, there's areas where, uh, you know, a $50,000, you know, expense is, is really not going to be, um, you know, the, the end of the thing. That's my timer that tells me that I'm, I wanted to wrap myself up in three minutes. So, so I think that those efficiencies are there. Um, and, but I think at the same time, and Allison was, was really co you know, strong on this point, there are also arguments to be made that if you really study the operating budget, there is a reality that that 50,000 is also a justified override of the town manager's um, recommendation. But I think that you know, getting into the weeds of those necessary, you know, those line item staffing um, decisions is not really the purview of the finance committee. You know, I think our, our job is really to sort of, as, uh, as Paul and others have said, set the bottom line budget. Um, and, and I think that we can do that. And, and I think that we can work with our friends on the, in the school department to, um, you know, to get a budget through as a part of a larger package um, that, that serves the needs of the students and, and does right by the town, by the taxpayers as well. Thanks, Andy. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna open it up for questions. I, uh, looking at the time and recognizing the, how much we have to do today, I'm asking that as, people frame questions to um, prioritize what you think are the most important questions to ask and see if we can, because I think that there's gonna be a lot of interest in questions in, in the opportunity to ask questions about the school budget. And I see that Kathy has her hand up and uh, so call on her first. Uh, thank you. Um uh, just a general comment, and I know you've been on a lot of time pressure, but I did discover I do have that one pager, but I have to take the one pager and subtract it from what I see in the town manager's budget to find the 52. I don't have a Word document explaining it, so I just think um, for the public to, if I didn't attend the school committee meeting, it would be hard to know or if I hadn't gotten three emails about this from, from other people, it would be hard to know. We are $52,800 above what was in the town manager's budget. So that's a comment. So I, I know we're not supposed to delve into the line items, but I have a few comments on um, pieces of it to try to understand um, what's going on where I feel like it is under control of uh, policies. So one, I'd asked, I think I'd asked on the regional school budget, and I do apologize, I didn't send these in an advance. I was just looking at this last night. Um, but on school choice for the elementary school, as I look through the trend line, we were running where the um, revenues were regularly coming either at or a little bit above what the expense line was looked at. And this is at, on page, uh, it's down in the revolving funds where you can see the school choice lines. I wrote down the page number, page 123. Um, but now it's coming in at, you're projecting it's coming in at a, a hundred plus below what you're receiving. So I, I, I sort of have a question on looking forward because one of my concerns, and I know this was stated in the school committee, is that 23 doesn't look too bad, 24 and 25 start to look like, what are we gonna do then? Because we don't have the ESSER money. So school choice is something I think we control the slots. If we're not breaking even on school choice, do we control that? So that's a question. Um, Doug, you alluded to the sixth grade moving up. Um, that's not in the 23 budget, but it will be in the 24 budget. So one of my questions on this, can you find internal resources without overriding the town manager's budget for this one year to do the change people want on art? Because if you look at what the budget's gonna look like 
in FY24, there's going to be some efficiencies. You're not quite sure where it is. And then you could be maintaining the staff in art and technology. So only you have those numbers. Um, so I don't know what really happens. So I don't know what happens to the special needs lines. I know regular teachers will move up with the kids for the sixth grade, but I don't know what happens in even the amount of time that's needed for art, for music, for everything else when 150 plus children move from being in these schools. So I'll stop with just those two because it looks to me like there's some flexibility within the budget. The one that was flagged in an email to us was the professional leave allocation of 30,000 that doesn't seem to be drawn on and you have to ask in advance. So as Matt said, I'm not trying to say where in the budget you could find 50 or 52, but it looks like there might be places for this, what I see as a one-year transition before the sixth grade moves up. So school choice and the transition are my big questions. Mike? Sure, so uh, I'll start with school choice. So I think that's an accurate statement that we are applying more school choice than we'd be bringing in. Our balance is very high uh, and we actually have reason that we wanna bring that down. At some point, um, having too high a school choice balance, the state and DOR will start asking questions of us of why are you maintaining that level of funding uh, in school choice. And so I think we are um, using more of it. And there's been many years where we had the opposite trend. And I think over time, to your larger point, we have to right size that. But I think a legitimate question would be, why aren't you using more school choice given the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are sitting in it? So it sort of plays against other things you said in some ways, but that's the you know, complexity yeah. of the budget. Um, I think as we transition to um, uh, the sixth grade, I think there's a lot of financial pieces that have to be worked through between the Amherst Public Schools and the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools. And I think there will be cost savings. They're not going to be reflected in next year's budget because the sixth grade will still be here. Uh, we have a group meeting the end of next month to try to map out uh, staff members, mostly teachers, to map out kind of the programmatic desires. We did a survey of families and staff. Uh, we met with all the students in the sixth grade and the student council at the middle school, high school. So we have a lot of engagement that's happening on that question. Uh, so we wanna intentionally develop what would be the program and then we can start figuring out the, the HR and financial pieces of that um, as well. So, so that process is ongoing. Um, the last thing I'd say is that we've got uh, now two of our many, uh, I think Doug referenced this year, uh, bargaining units have agreed to contracts for next year. So um, I think, you know, to the larger point of professional leave and other things, uh, could we look at those and, and bring the number now down that was going to town council? Sure, but then if contracts end up costing more than anticipated, then we'll be back with you in the fall um, saying, ooh, well, you know, this we're in a hard place now. So we're trying to balance the realities that we don't have all of our contracts settled for next year. We think we made a good faith effort at, um, you know, by a control accounts of managing what a reasonable um, amount of money would be for that. Um, but since they're not resolved, we're a little cautious about um, putting any flexibility in our budget all to something until uh, we know what our bottom line is right now. And, and budgets are always estimates. There's always unexpected things that happen, but uh, having contracts that are not settled is a pretty significant one. I don't know, Doug, if you would like to add to any of that or if that captures what you might have said more eloquently than me. No, I think that captures it well. Thank you. Okay. So um, as is our practice when we get to this stage, um, I recognize uh, all counselors and finance committee members for questions and order that I see hands go up. So Mandy. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, and thank you for inviting the whole council to, to this meeting. Um, so I struggle with the school committee's request. Um, you know, I don't disagree that it's hard every year to come in at the council's guidance, but for the last five years or so, the school committee has been able to do so. So has the library trustees and so has our town manager. Um, and this year, the library trustees had to probably make hard choices to come in at the council's guidance. The town manager, I'm sure, had to make hard choices to come in at the council's guidance um, in order to you know, in some sense, respect the council's guidance, yet the school committee did not do that. Um, and it doesn't even appear they 
looked to see what would need to be reduced um, in order to come in at that guidance. And so, you know, I think the council then is left with figuring out whether there is, you know, money within the current line item budget that would be not necessarily need to be expended in order to come in at the council's guidance, which is, you know, more in depth than we tend to go because we try to leave that to the school committee, but the school committee basically in my mind passed that to us because they said we can't do it or we don't want to do it and I don't know which one it was. Um, but the realities are every year there's a limited pot of money and we have to allocate that and two of the three of the four um, large departments regional school library and general government were able to make those hard choices and the schools weren't. Um, and so I, in reviewing, I sent a lot of questions over and in reviewing, I think I agree with Matt that there's money in there so that we could pass a school committee, a school elementary school budget that meets the council guidelines. Because I think there's some money in there that would be able to do that. But my question, you know, beyond the sixth grade stuff, I could get into some specifics um, specific to the art and technology as sixth grade moves in a year. Um, the, those teachers won't need to teach those classes. And so the FTE numbers will probably go down next year, or they probably should in FY24. But my question is more about the ESSER support. Um, you know, the school committee is using the ESSER money to not have to, um, in, or in essence, not to comply with the council guidelines by a couple of hundred thousand dollars this year. Um, as Mike and uh, Dr. Morris and Doug Slaughter said, that disappears in FY25, um, early in FY25. Um, and so I wanna know what the ESSER money is supporting this year, what it's intended to support next year, whether those supports were increases specifically due to COVID such that when ESSER is no longer available for budget support, um, will they be, will that, that necessary decrease because of the use of one-time money be said to be the end of additional COVID related services no longer needed to be funded because it was services that were increased due to COVID and then we don't need them anymore? Or is the school committee going to say it's yet another cut to level services that then we're going to be facing instead of a level services number that's based on what the council funds, a level services number that is based hundreds of thousands of dollars above that so that the school committee then comes to us and says, well, we can't meet your guidelines again because we started 300,000 above and went even higher. And so, you know, that's where I wanna know how is that SR money going to be treated in the next couple of funding years in terms of when we issue guidelines, our guidelines will be issued not on SR funding, but on our own um, numbers. Thanks. Allison or, or right. yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll just uh, comment on the school committee and I think Mike's hand is raised may, maybe to talk more detail in the mechanics of, of Mandy Joe's question but I think um, you know the question about can the school committee make hard decisions the school committee has made hard decisions and made hard and hard choices and cuts um, since at least as long as I've been on the school committee since um, fiscal 18. So just to just to sort of delimitate them, you know, it's over four hundred thousand dollars is what we're using ESSER to support our ongoing services. And as I started this um, conversation, it's it's not because we're not willing to meet the the guidance. It's because our children in our schools need this support now. They are um, we right now is not the time to be making these painful painful cuts in order to um, to meet a guidance. Um, when we have the funding here to support the recovery from COVID and pandemic and our educational um, and um, social and emotional recovery from the pandemic, it's important It's an important and valid use of our ESSER funds to support that. So that's why we're using the ESSER so significantly to um, our ongoing budget. But to your question about can we make cuts and not trusting that the school committee can make hard decisions. We have a track record of doing that in the school district, um, as, as Matt Holloway is talking about, 
has, has that fiscal responsibility and has demonstrated that year after year after year. Um, so just to, just to cite some of those, we actually added to services and were able to still remain and, uh, and, and reduce some level of services to make that add of food services and some staff ads in FY18 in order to stay within town guidance. In FY19, the school committee made over $430,000 in cuts, including to staff and relied on additional school choice tuition funding to protect some of the ongoing programs and services and still meet town guidance. In FY20, um, the school district made over 220,000, including enrollment driven cuts. So the question about whether we can make, whether we look for efficiencies and not just cuts to level services, the school committee has demonstrated to do that. We also launched the Common Emphasis Dual Language Program while still staying within the town guidance. In FY21, we made net reductions to ongoing programs of over $750,000 to meet town guidance. And in the current year, we made cuts of, of about $300,000 in order to meet town guidance. So we've made historically over a million dollars in cuts to our ongoing programs and services. We are using this 400,000 in ESSER so that we don't have to make those painful cuts during the year when our students and our staff need it most. When the, the conversation about sort of um, uh, increasing our ongoing budget or our permanent budget in a way that we won't be able to make cuts later. Doug talked about some of the efficiencies that we might that we will be getting when we move to sixth grade, move the sixth grade to the middle school. We don't we haven't outlined all of that yet, but we but that was one of part of the conversation of the school committee decision in adding to sort of the ongoing operating budget as opposed to using ESSER funds. We know that we will. Um, have significant efficiencies when our sixth grade moves to the middle school. And um, in future years, um, knock wood, we will have even more efficiencies when we move to the um, a new consolidated school building. So the use of ESSER funds and this um, increase in the, uh, the operating budget is intended to help us bridge that, um, that time so that we can continue to support our students in the way that they need it right now. Right. Sure. Um, so I'll just uh, more specifically on ESSER, uh, some of the things are one time costs that we've spent funds on tents, uh, outdoor seating areas, um, you know, there are like um, filters for HVAC, you know, uh, additional HVAC systems and filters for those systems. Um, so there definitely are um, things that are directly related to COVID uh, replacement for lost books during the pandemic. We had um, significant number we had a kind of library pickup system we, we acknowledged that not every book was going to make it back uh, that was, was doing that so there were some one-time costs that uh, were part of our ESSER funding um, there are other costs that we're spending right now that are you know we hope are short term which is additional social emotional support additional counseling support uh, well I don't think the effects of um, the first 15 months of the pandemic are going to go away immediately they're more acute now. I hope they're more acute now than they are in two years from now. So, I mean, I think that's sort of the way we are thinking about that. Uh, and then there's some other things that are gonna be hard. Uh, you know, another example is summer busing. So we have more um, summer um, support programs at the elementary level than we typically would have. So um, we're funding some of those with ESSER about both academic, but also social emotional uh, support for students. So there are the majority of our funds uh, that were we have been applying, have been focused on things that are, you know, directly related to the pandemic, and we hope uh, are long term. And, and an example of something that is fading is this year we've had, uh, and last year when kids came back, we've had certified nurses assistants in medical waiting rooms. We're shifting away from that model. It's no longer recommended by Department of Health. It's a pretty significant cost. It was something we needed to do. It was recommended by the kind of health authorities. Uh, that's not going to be budgeted for ESSER for next year. We're not planning on, on spending it. So we are trying to fade ESSER in places that uh, we can. I think one of the huge variables is we don't know what level of support we're going to receive from the state next year is as for things like rapid testing, which has been a huge part of our protocol. My understanding is that's not going to be extended. Pool testing, my understanding right now is that's not going to be extended. So uh, we do have some unknowns and some variables about ESSER funding. We also don't know how the virus is obviously going to track. We're at a higher point. We made a recommendation around masking, not a mandate. Uh, two days ago, I think, because we are seeing increased numbers, uh, both regionally, locally. So I think that, that there's a lot of variables in there. Uh, and to your larger point, um, 
that's not everything. There are other things that we're spending ESSER on, specifically the budget support, uh, that's funding roles that existed prior to COVID. And you know, you're right, there's gonna be some very difficult conversations that have to happen over time. And, and I do agree with Allison's point that at least my experience at the school committee is they have gotten comfortable with uncomfortable conversations uh, prior to the, the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic, uh, every meeting was a challenging meeting. I think someone categorized how many times the three school committees met uh, in the first year of the pandemic, and it was it was a pretty wacky number, and there was a lot of um, divergence in viewpoints being expressed at, at all of those meetings. So um, I want to acknowledge and honor the point you're raising about ESSER, answer with some more details, and also note that uh, I think what I hear everybody agreeing with is that there's going to be more challenging conversations ahead, um, and I can't predict how the school committee, I think you asked a question about, you know, would view the loss of ESSER funds and, and you know, level services. That's for future school committee to, to think about it. It's just, you know, for us, we, you know, in the schools tried to, the school department understood the, the very, to us, reasonable concern about uh, where we were in budget and where what services we want to provide for students in this time of transition and challenge. Uh, and we tried to meet those as best we could. Yeah, thank you. I am going to um, put myself in line for asking a couple of questions, but I'm going to um, stick with uh, other counselors now. Pam? Thanks. Um, I appreciate Mandy Joe's very thorough questions, and I, I would also support that uh, it feels like we could um, meet the town guidance and that there's enough flexibility in there to, to meet the town guidance. Um, the question I have is actually um, looking forward, does the, does the movement of the sixth grade to the regional school, is there, a, is there a cost to us in some shape or form? Do, does, does that move come at the cost of either, either the regional budget or the elementary school budget? Certainly. Yep, so I can jump in just to say that uh, that that's gonna to need to be some conversations probably in the fall between the Amherst School Committee and the Regional School Committee about a rental agreement. Again, once we have a program in place, then we'll be able to have much more detailed conversations. Um, it is two different districts, so there will be some level of rental, uh, I imagine, um, if I was a fair, fair neutral person, most places don't give other places space for free. Um, so I think we'll have to work on that. Um, so I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm not a decision maker on that. Uh, but I think, you know, my experience is the Emerson Regional School Committees have collaborated uh, a lot on school start times, on uh, this, on sixth grade to middle school with multiple meetings. And I think the Emerson School members have done a great job of acknowledging their role when they're on the different committees. It's a bureaucratic nightmare and they make it look very smooth. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, but I think you're, you're, it's a reasonable question to ask. And I think we'll have better information in the fall to be able to give you more clear answers once we know what the program looks like. Andy, can I add to that real quick? Sure. And um, just to um, add to what Dr. Morris said, we've budgeted for some years of that transition in ARPA. That was one of the um, initial ARP allocations was to support the transition um, infrastructure needs and planning needs and some of that. I think some of the rent in those early years is an estimate of that is included. We appreciate the town support on that. Thank you for mentioning. I should have, my apologies, Sean. So my questions were um, sort of two things. One, was, and they both come back to the fact that the request that was being made for the additional funds ultimately comes back to um, art and technology teachers who were reduced to part-time from full-time day, I believe 80% last year, and to bring them uh, back up to full-time. And uh, so the two questions that I had was that if money were added to the budget, were there other things that would be considered uh, or how does that come out of things that would be done with an additional $50,000 to be the highest priority? And the second question that comes out of that is that if it were done, then what happens the year after? Are there funds that are gonna continue or is there gonna be pressure to 
go backwards on that decision yet once again, especially as we uh, look at staffing needs and are moving sixth grade um, to another school. So there's you know, questions about evenness of staffing levels in a very narrow area and particular needs. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so I can jump in if that's okay. Uh, and the first question, as opposed to most other years, um, the school committee has already made a statement and passed a budget that was inclusive of art and technology. Um, FTEs being added if the higher budget's added. So um, this is a little different than other years where um, the school committee had, not I can think of an example a while back where it was town council, but town council voted a higher budget than, uh, was originally suggested, uh, and in that scenario, um, the superintendent, you know, sort of had discretion on that. And in this instance, the school committee has stated their uh, what they want that fund those funds used on. Um, so it's a little bit to me, it's not quite analogous as the scenario that you may recall from probably six or seven years ago, Andy. I think on the second question, I want to remind folks that when the sixth grade moves to the middle school, the Amherst Elementary District will have the same number of students as if they didn't move to the middle school. So are there efficiencies to be had? Absolutely. The real efficiencies are going to occur when the building project is complete. At that point, we're going to be in a much more efficient model fiscally, space-wise, energy-wise. Um, but we're going to have the same number of students. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want people to perhaps believe that there's gonna be uh, significant amounts of efficiencies uh, because we're not changing the models in a way that we would when we go from three buildings to two buildings. I think that conversation and those efficiencies would be, will, will dwarf whatever efficiencies come from uh, the, the sixth grade to the middle school move. Um, the students are still gonna need specials. They're still gonna learn how to play violin. They're still going to, you know, have PE class and um, they're still gonna be uh, on the books for the Amherst Elementary School District to be paying for. So uh, I don't wanna be overly, uh, I mean, I think there will be some efficiencies. I do believe there will be. I don't wanna minimize that, but I, I also think, um, again, the, the real efficiencies will come from uh, the completion of that building project, which is hopefully, uh, you know, coming in four years. Uh, for, you know, somewhat less than that. Um, but I think that will be determined by a body that doesn't just include me. Um, Mandy? Yeah, this question is actually probably more for Paul and um, Sean. So we started the conversation with the, the uh, state aid number in the budget presented to the council is the same as the projection back in January. Um, and we don't know where it will be. So that's Sean explained in a nice way why that number stays the same. But if we pass a bottom line budget here and the state aid numbers go up, um, whether that's significant or not, 100,000, 200,000, who knows what it will be, Aga, you know, if Aga goes up. What happens is, is do we keep our revenue budget the same and such that if the state aid numbers increase because of the gov because of whatever budget is passed at the state, does that mean we collect less in property taxes to keep the revenue numbers the same and so that there's a lower tax rate? Or do we continue to collect the same amount of taxes that we had in our revenue budget that we passed and then we're just increasing the revenue? And if that's the case, um, do we then are we capable of then passing sort of in a supplemental budget like the state tends to do? What has been our practice, Paul and Sean? Yeah, so I can speak to that. Um, so if the revenues, when we get to November and we do the, the recap and we look at all of our revenues, if the state aid line item is higher than what we've budgeted. Um, that will be factored in while looking at our local receipt revenues and what those are doing. Um, and um, and also the property taxes. So it, it's possible that the higher state aid might go to offset lower local receipts. Um, it's possible it could uh, hit the property taxes. Um, and it is possible that um, we could do a supplemental appropriation. We, um, in talking with Sonia before this, 
you know, if there was going to be a supplemental appropriation, we would want to do it before the recap so that it's, you really have to do it before the recap so that it's part of the budget. If it happens after the recap, you have to pull it from reserves. Um, so if we wanted to use current revenues next year, if it turns out that they are higher, um, that would action, the best path for that action to take would be between July and October um, so that it would be built into the recap in the fall and, and November usually is when we do that. Bernie? Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, uh, and Mandy Joe asked a question that I, um, I had in mind. Uh, you know, we looking at the cherry sheet numbers, which is always one of those magical things that you do. Uh, uh, I tried to, I looked at it before I had my second cup of coffee this morning. So um, I'm not sure I'll represent them accurately, but it, it appears that uh, the, uh, the House budget and the proposed Senate budget are in agreement. Both those budgets are higher than what the governor uh, is willing to, uh, uh, was willing to put forward. And uh, even what the governor was willing to put forward is about thirty-two, dollars $34,000 more than what we have currently. Uh, so I think it's a safe bet that there's gonna be some money. There may not be, um, it's wacky to think about a $90 million budget, talking about $50,000. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some money. Uh, I also think at this point, we need to, uh, in the past, we've shown some trust between uh, departments, between the components of the town. And I think at this point, we need to, to, uh, to, to trust that the schools will do the best they can to keep their uh, spending down and in line. Uh, they certainly have a track record of doing that. I think we can trust that uh, we understand there's a $50,000 potential hole that we may need to fill some way, manner, or form. And it's quite likely that that could happen in November. Um, I, I appreciate the fact. We have to have a balanced budget before we can set the tax rate. So that's uh, Sean's point that if we're going to do this, we need to do this before we, uh, uh, we set the tax rate. Um, so I think there's room down the, down the road to say, yeah, we, we, we understand what the problem is. Um, we understand that 24 and 25 are gonna be uh, ugly uh, challenge. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna go into this uh, uh, with some mutual resolve here. The, the school committees put down a marker that they, they may be $50,000 short. Um, we should say we understand that and we will do in good faith, whatever we can to remedy that um, in the, uh, at the end of October, early November before we set the tax rate. Okay. Lynn? Yeah, I just want to summarize the question before the Finance Committee and ultimately the Council is whether or not we're going to approve the budget with a line item for the schools as recommended by the town manager, which is based on the budget guidelines we as a town council set back in December. That's the question, okay? And I appreciate all of the questions that have been asked and the ongoing discussion and willingness to answer those and any other questions about what happens here in the school budget and what happens there. But ultimately, that is the school committee's decision. It's not the council's decision. We can say, yeah, I think, gee, you could find this here, you could find that there. But I just wanna make sure that we understand the question before a finance committee and before the council. It is not to tell the schools how to spend their money. It's whether we're going to give them the amount of money that we set in our budget or whether we're going to increase that amount. Thanks. I think that's... Uh fair statement I do we do ultimately um, react to the it was a programmatic recommendation the school committee essentially was saying we think that adding to these part-time positions or to returning them to full-time is an essential priority for the schools Allison 
explained that to us. And so we are looking at that question and which was why I was asking the question about sustainability of the addition of staff over a period of future years, because I do think, I, I do look at the next couple of years as being extremely difficult budget years. And uh, the pain that we're dealing with now may uh, be mi minor compared to pain we're dealing with in a few years. Uh, we just don't know. So I do, that's why I think that these questions have been, it has been a very important valid discussion. Are there other comments from counselors or members of the finance committee? Um, questions that um, people would like to ask of um, our superintendent, his staff, well, and of the school committee chair. So I don't see any other hands. I um, think that we're just going to have to grapple with this discussion. The process that goes forward is that um, we have this series of meetings and try and get as much information as we can. If we have supplemental questions that come up in our later discussion, we may ask them, but it's not that we expect people to come back to a second time, we may just send a memo uh, saying we have these additional thoughts that we just uh, want the answers. We will make a recommendation um, towards the end of the 30 days that we're allotted to make that and pass it along to the committee. And uh, I think that uh, we've had enough discussion that everybody understands what the process is going forward. So is there anybody who wants to make any concluding comments or ask any concluding questions? Seeing none, I uh, want to thank you, uh, Mike, Allison, and uh, Doug. I really appreciate your being here. It's been, a, uh, I think, an important discussion that we've had. And, uh, um, but thank you. And I uh, see that uh, Sharon Sherry is here uh, because we do need to move along to the, to the library. Uh, Sharon, welcome. Thank you. Hi to everybody. Hi. What an amazing day outside, huh? Yes. <laughs> so and thank you for bringing us back to reality and pointing that out. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to yeah make it worse. Can, can we just go outside and have this meeting? Um, we all have to take our computers outside with us to do that. Uh, so what we've been doing is uh, starting out by offering the opportunity for uh, the, you, in this case, to make a uh, brief presentation to the Finance Committee. Uh, and uh, then we would turn to questions from the committee about the budget. So do you have, turn it to you. Awesome. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, as I said, thank you so much for having me uh, and I will, I'll jump right in. Uh, so revenue sources. So 78% of the library's total operating budget does come from the municipal appropriation. We are definitely a town department. The appropriation is only used for staff salaries and benefits and, the, and rent we pay uh, to use the Munson Memorial Library. The town appropriation does not fund books or maintenance, utilities, or programming. State aid accounts for a very small portion of our budget, but it's a really important bucket for us uh, because we need those funds to cover the staff salaries that are not covered by the town appropriation. And then 8% of our budget comes from donations 
uh, to the friends, the sale of merchandise like t-shirts and umbrellas and things like that, and meeting room and printing fees. Our endowment has been happy this past year, I got to say. Uh, so 12% of the library's operating budget will come from the endowment draw during FY23. On the 30th of June in, F in 2021, the endowment was at $9.8 million. And the separate Woodbury Fund was at almost $800,000. For FY23, the trustees did approve a 4% draw rate. And regarding expenses, 66% of the library's expenses are that of personnel, 12% uh, is of, of benefits. 9% of our budget goes towards circulating materials such as books and magazines and digital content. And our utilities account for about 4% of our budget and maintenance about 3%. So this FY23 budget was approved by the trustees back in March. Uh, we are showing a 0.7% increase from FY22. Um, under expenses, uh, we're showing it a 0.8% increase to salaries, a 4% decreases to the benefits, a 4% increase to materials, 7% increase to operations, uh, a 5.8% contractual decrease to CW Mars, a hefty increase to repairs just because um, our building project has been put off by about a year and a half or so. So because we're going to be here longer, I, I've had to set aside more money because things are just falling apart. Um, and a 5% decrease to utilities. And we have level funded our, our programming lines. Under revenue sources, we're showing the 2.5% increase to the municipal appropriation, a 4.7% increase in the endowment draw, but and that's the dollar figure. The, the rate is still a 4% draw rate. Uh, we're showing a 40% decrease in the use of state aid. Um, and now that the friends are responsible for all of the library's fundraising efforts, the next two lines on your screen, that they're starting to mingle with each other quite a bit. Um, so we are not budgeting for a SAMI's to occur during FY23. We did not have one during FY22 either. Um, grants are applied for by staff, but the restricted gifts, the donations to the friends and the Woodbury funds are now all under the umbrella of the friends. Thus, um, when calculating the increase or decrease on the reliance of those kinds of funds, both of those lines should really be added together. And so what you would find is, is really level funding between um, 22 and 23. And we have also level funded those remaining four lines, the fees, special collections, sale of goods. So on your screen are the uh, 11 questions I received from the Finance Committee in writing prior to today's meeting. I, I have sent my answers to you all in writing, but I thought you'd like me to answer uh, some of them now uh, for the people who are watching. Um, during FY21, the library received just over $36,000 in CARES Act funds from the town, but we have not received any ARPA funds. Regarding staffing, uh, so prior to COVID, the library saw two retirements, and due to financial constraints, those positions went unfilled and they remain unfilled. Then COVID happened, and the library saw several additional retirements. Uh, some of those people have been replaced. There are two two of those positions. Some of them are in the process of being replaced. So there's three people, uh, that three positions that we're in the process of replacing. And some are going to remain unfilled during FY23. So there's two of those positions. And the library has never had any problem attracting and retaining staff. You know, in library circles, the Jones really has a, a reputation and, and Amherst, the Jones and Amherst has a reputation for being a, a great place to work. Um, then I was asked about the mix of full and part-time positions. So we have got 22 uh, full-time, fully benefited staff members. Uh, 
uh, there are four positions available to the town that are fully benefited, but are we are not uh, filling. So those positions are remaining vacant. Uh, and then there are three positions that are also over 20 hours a week. They're not quite full time, um, but they are fully benefited positions. Uh, under 20 folks, we have 24 positions that are, uh, are people who are working less than 20 hours a week and they receive prorated benefits. And then we have five uh, substitutes who are also under 20 hours a week and get prorated benefits. And so the reason that I really wanted to talk about this is because the issue of part-timers at the library, it's talked about every year. And so again, I, I just want the opportunity to say if the town wants the library to turn more of those part-time positions into full-time positions, we would be thrilled to do it, but the town would, would need to appropriate a larger sum of money. So for example, in order to control the number of benefited staff that are employed by the entire town, each department has been given a cap as to the number of full-time staff it can hire. Um, so in the case of the library, as I've mentioned before, the town would allow the library to hire an additional four full-time staff members. Um, so if each of those positions are going to cost $40,000 a year, for example, I mean, it depends on what kind of position it is, but on average, $40,000 a piece. So that's an additional $160,000 a year. And that doesn't include benefits. So if you want to tack on an additional $13,000 or so for each, each position, that's another fifty-two grand. So the total is about $212,000 annually and that additional money would have to come from the town. Um, so I just, I, I, yeah, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, more questions about children's room staffing. Right now there are 13 staff members who are working in our children's room. Three of them are full-time, five of them are part-time, three of them are shelters and two of them are substitutes. So, Due to the aforementioned retirements and unfilled positions, we are low in staffing at the adult circulation desk, which is why it seems like we have so many more staff in the children's room. Normally we have more, we have those, normally those two departments are equal. So in the adult room, we only require one shelver uh, because she's retired and so she can work more hours during the week. In the kids room, we tend to use student shelvers. It's an awesome way to get, um, to get kids involved in the library, working in the library. Most librarians start off as shelvers at some point. And so this is a really you know, nice way to do that. But, but students don't have as many hours to, to do this kind of work, which means we need more of them. Um, yeah, so that's, those are all my comments about that, and I'm happy to answer more as you guys need me to. Um, a couple updates on the project. Uh, so our, I, we, we have an updated timeline, and that's what's on your screen right now. The schematic design phase uh, picked up again this week, and it's going to run until the end of July. Design development will then take place from August through November of this year. Then the, we'll move into the construction document phase, which will take place from December of this year through June of next year. And then you have the bid phase, which will last for three months next summer. Construction is expected to begin in October of 2023. And then two years later, the grand opening celebration is expected to take place in June of 2025. Uh, regarding the capital campaign, so towards its goal of raising 6.6 .6 million, the, the, and that's out of all the sources. Uh, the capital campaign committee has received gifts and statements of intention totaling 1.7 million and change from 160 different families. Uh, this is in addition to the $1 million in CPA funding and a $46,000 grant from the Frank Stanley Beverage Foundation. And we found out a couple of weeks ago that uh, Representative Dom was able to earmark $50,000 for us for the ESL department. Um, and then there are, there are lots of other things that are going on, but that's what we have secured. That's my, that's my brief spiel. Did I do it in ten, my 10 minutes or less?
Uh, yes, happy happy to answer whatever questions you guys have. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, the process, uh, Alice McDonald's uh, from the school committee was in, in the last uh, meeting. Um, I noticed that Bob Pam for your, from your trustees is in. Would you like to have him brought into the meeting? Absolutely. Let me make that go away. Um, yeah, definitely. So I think that Athena or whoever is managing the meeting can do that for us. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'm going to, um, this has been the uh, practice. I want to, um, first of all, see if uh, Bernie has any additional um, questions or comments uh, since he was the one who was assigned to library and then go to raised hands. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sharon. You, you, you made life easier. We managed to hit almost all the, all the points. Um, I want to ask you about the unfilled positions. Is it your intent, the library's intention to fill those positions in the next year? They're in the budget. Um, they're not in the budget. They're, they're not in the budget. No, they're vacant. They're not, they're not a part of our mm -hmm. no. Okay, but you still carry them as, as vacancies. They are, uh, they are there. The town uh, has allowed us that that's a part of the, the cap uh, for position control. Uh, there was once the people in those four positions, but we just haven't been able to um, afford to fill okay. them. Uh, yeah, I just would add that that makes life, for, at least for me, a little confusing. Because I'm, um, my practice has always been if there's a vacant position, it's budgeted for it because there's an intent to fill it. Um, so, but these are positions that aren't aren't planned for uh, in the next uh, fiscal year. Correct. They're not budgeted for. Okay. Uh, the other piece that I noticed, and this is uh, probably in the weeds too much, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, I noticed in one of the the uh, library committee meetings there were some concerns about um, uh, accounting. And I was wondering if the uh, the budget that you're proposing uh, gives you the wherewithal to get the new software that you seem to need, and if you've talked with town staff about uh, some possibly integrating that uh, software with the town software. Yeah, so we we use the Munis functions for our town money. Uh, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's the town appropriation or JCPC, the IT funds. We we take care of personnel. You know, when somebody is hired, and so we do use Munis. But our corporation doesn't. We don't need something that robust. Um, Munis is a beast, as you guys all know. Um, so all our corporation needs is something as simple as QuickBooks, um, and that's what we're looking to upgrade to the cloud version. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember when Eunice was new, um, unfortunately. Um, thank you. I think you, uh, I appreciate the uh, written uh, responses to the, the capital questions. I don't have any follow up on that. I'm not sure if this does. But I, I think you, uh, um, I think the, uh, um, I th want to thank you for your responses and uh, we'll see what else people have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, welcome to Bob Pam and Bob. At any point that you'd like to be recognized, please raise your hand and uh, I'll proceed accordingly. Uh, Lynn, uh, you had your. Yeah, first of all, uh, Sharon, thanks for being with us. And Andy, thanks for bringing Bob into the room because my next question pertains to the endowment, <laughs> um, which I know Bob is the expert on. Uh, is 4% what we have taken from the endowment in the past? And let me couch this particularly for new counselors. The reason I ask that is because the town has an MOU with the library uh, with regard to their fundraising that over a five year period at the end of the five years, if they do not reach what they need initially, the numbers can change, but let's not get into the construction and numbers, okay? That's not the budget here today, but that we they that the library would then draw from their endowment to bring up the money to the level that was originally, um, if you will, uh, attributed to uh, the Jones Library for raising the money. Okay, so that's my question. Uh, I'll just 
quickly say and then definitely hand it over to Bob. Yes, that, uh, th this this year, FY22, it's 4%. Um, I want to say before that it might have been 4.5%. But then the previous, let's say three or four years, it was at it was at 4%. Um, so this, this set of trustees that, uh, that we've been working with, really led by Bob, I would have to say, um, has been really great at at their goal is 4% and sticking to it and making those hard decisions, um, you know, when it's not been a lot of fun. Now, now I'll turn it over to Bob. Uh, <clears throat> the library has a policy of 4% per year as being the sustainable level at which we will uh, make withdrawals from the endowment. Um, this came about because in to go back 10 years, there were long periods when we would withdraw six or 7% per year. Uh, and the, the way in which that was then adjusted was by bringing it down at a half percent per year over a, a number of years. Um, we have, for the most part, stuck to that. There have been uh, one or two years in which um, the, the needs were greater than that. And so um, we went to 4.5 at one point. Um, as, as we have been making shifts into more electronics, there was one point where we went to 4.6, um, but for the most part, it's 4%, that is the standard, and it is based upon a rolling 12-quarter uh, average, and so it is looking at dollar amounts based upon what the endowment is, not at a particular moment in time, but rather what it is over a period of time. Um, and that gives us some security that the, the amount that's available for operations will not shift radically from one year to the next. Um, but it also means that in a year that it goes way up high, we're not gonna get a, a huge amount more money. And when it goes down, we're not gonna get a huge amount less. Thank you. Okay, so Kathy. Okay, staying with the endowment for uh, uh, first part of my question, um, the endowment that we were shown was as of June, 2021. Um, and I know from multiple sources, including our own, that does not look like what the most recent year has looked like. So um, how are, to the extent you're seeing a balance now in uh, April or May, Bob, in the endowment, um, do, do you expect you're gonna be able to generate at least that? Um, where are you in terms of projecting on where it's going? On, on the health of the endowment. So I, you know, it, and I know last year it went up and then went back down. So maybe you're still on the upside as of May compared to June, um, but that happy story wouldn't happen. So that's question number one. And two, on the large project and the timeline, one thing I noted is a, it's a much longer timeline than when we were voting on it at the council level. Uh, at least one of the timelines we saw, I did see, in the trustees thing that there was a longer one. But my question is, if the bids come in, when you finally get the construction papers out on the street and they echo the experience that we've seen in the North Amherst Library, where uh, we came in at about 50% higher than what had been projected in November, the March numbers came in higher and I had heard the library could be as in the area of 5 million. What, what's the plan? What happens? Because the total can't go up. Um, so um, if the total can't go up, does that mean you have three or $4 million that you have to raise in your fundraising effort? And or do you come back to the town and say, we're not sure we can do it? So I, I, just, I, I just don't know what the plan is and when we would see that decision. Um, I guess, I, you know, you gave the timeline on the construction budget. And then my last is a much smaller one. Um, in the capital budget, as you know, because you gave us an explanation of it, we have mobile shelves. 
um, unit coming in to the room that has been the exhibit room. So you can move the special collections out of the storage area where you've got tarps over them. I have just a basic, why didn't we move them two years ago? Why didn't we move them when the building was closed and we first heard that there was water damage in there? Um, and when I go to the library, I don't see the, the exhibit room being used all that much. So I think it's probably a good place to move them. And, and would you use those mobile shelves? You've said you will use them in the new library, but you're so near to packing up everything and storing it. Um, buying shelving units for an exhibit room where I think maybe you'll move everything onto these rolling shelves when you get them for six months, and then you'll put them in a box and you'll store them all. So I'm just, you know, on, in terms of your timeline on when the construction might start on the library. So it's just, a, it's sort of a question of uh, some things are gonna have to go into storage anyway, and why didn't we just move them? So those are moving from one down. Uh, so the endowment health going forward, what happens if we're way over budget when the construction comes in and then the picky issue? on mobile shelves. So let me start and then Bob can fill in all the gaps um, and starting at the end. So regarding, um, yeah, the, the shelving. So the shelving is not gonna go into storage at any point. It would be used now uh, and then it'll be used for the, the North Amherst Library project and then it'll be used for the Jones project. So it's not, this is not superfluous shelving. Uh, regarding the timing of it. So if there hadn't been a lawsuit, we would have uh, been well on our way uh, to this project moving forward. We did not want to ask this money. We did not want to come to JCPC for, what is it, 40 grand, whatever it is. We were trying to hold off. Not only is it an expense, but it's also a lot of work. So this is not something we're looking forward to. So there's the shelving piece. Uh, regarding um, the project budget, I'm really glad that you asked about that. Um, the more the end, the end game is, we, like you said, we have a budget and we're going to stick to that budget. This project is going to happen within that allotted it's not going to be a penny more, uh, and it will be a combination of additional fundraising as well as hard cuts that will have to be made. Um, we, for example, we just had a discussion at the most recent building committee about cutting the cross laminated timber. Um, the, the committee at the time chose not to do that because that is one of our fundraising opportunities. There are people out there that we are talking with that are interested in donating only because of the net zero ready uh, possibility of the space. And so there will be other cuts along the way and our fundraising. So, so that, and, and when Sharon, that happens. Can I add after you're done on that one? Yes, hang on. Okay. So, and and you asked when that would happen. It's a totally ongoing process. It happens. It will happen at every meeting we go to. the The CLT vote had to happen now um, because that's by cutting that now, it would save the most money, about five hundred thousand um, dollars. If we choose to cut it a year from now, for example, after the the bids come back. It will cost, it will save us less than that because it means that um, some more architectural work will have to happen and there will be a cost to that. Um, but that was a, a, a risk the committee decided to take. You know, we've spoken with the MBLC, the OPM and the architects. This budget uh, overage by, we're talking about 3.6, 3.7, 3.8 million dollars. It's not a lot of money in the scheme of a $38 million project. This happens all the time. Uh, and it would be happening, we would be having these budget discussions even if COVID had never happened. Um, we don't know where it's gonna go, but we know that our work before us is to keep the project on budget and the architects are very aware of that. And I'll let Sean answer and then go on to Bob. I was just going to add that there's a much, much more robust cost estimating process with this project than there was with like the North Amherst Library, which was, you know, it wasn't through a grant program. It's similar to the schools, Kathy, where there's cost estimates along the way. They're making adjustments each time we get cost estimates to get the project within budget um, to avoid the situation you described where we go out to bid and we get surprises. Um, and even when we do go out to bid, if there's any concerns about getting bids within the budget, um, they usually will set up a, a, a 
a number of alternates where you know they'll bid out and if it comes in higher they can remove an alternate or if it comes in lower they can add an alternate to get to the budget um so the opm and the designers you know there's there's multiple mechanisms they'll use to make sure that we come in on budget when they go out to bid just interject quickly that um doing cost estimations at a routine basis is part of construction projects now and they're they're professional cost estimators to get brought in to double check numbers mm -hmm. Sean, was there anything you no, wanted? No, I just wanted to add that piece to it. <clears throat> Part uh, of your question you... related to the endowment. So, uh, Kathy, just so that you're clear, um, this has been pretty awful since January. Um, the total of value of the endowment as of the end of April was about $8.7 million, which is a lot less than it was back in June 30th. Um, <clears throat> when I was trying to figure out what would be the impact uh, of having to do withdrawals from the endowment in order to cover any uh, shortfalls in the funding of the project. I started with an assumption that, that the value of the endowment was $8 million and that, that we could manage even if it went down to about six. So, um, we're still not in trouble. Um, and I don't know where the market will go. That, that happens to be something that nobody knows. Um, but I just wanted to tell you where we are. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, there's a, uh, we may want to have this uh, conversation a little bit more extensively, just one-on-one -on -one later, but um, question had come up at, you know, I am a member of the Mass Municipal Association's Fiscal Policy Committee, and question came up in the last meeting of the committee about the impact on local communities um, of increases in costs in construction projects, and um, whether the school building authority or the board of library commissioners ought to be um, showing flexibility either in the amount that they're giving or in their expectations for the building, such as reducing building size. Um, has there been any indication that um, MBLC is willing to engage in, uh, with us in those discussions? So, uh, yeah, uh, again, I'm really glad that you asked. So, uh, yes, we've had those conversations with the MBLC. No, um, it is written into the regulation. It's written into the contract. Um, and, you know, because they have lots of libraries that they're trying to fund, they will not be giving Amherst any more money. Um, but so that being said, if... If, if the greater powers that be are able to uh, funnel money to, you know, the, the, these libraries, it's certainly not only Amherst, but, you know, if, if Comerford, uh, McGovern, et cetera, are able to give money specifically to Amherst because of these rising costs uh, due to COVID, that would be lovely, but it'll have to be separate from the MBLC. Thank you, Lynn. Um, first of all, I want to be, again, clear with the council. We're here for the operating budget for the library, not the capital. But given the fact that we have Sharon and Bob in the room, some of us just can't resist. And my next question actually is slightly related to that. And it's really a, a question to both you and Paul. And that is, you have a big move coming. And some of that I'm assuming may be to the branch libraries, but some of it may be for significant storage. And I, you know, we're very clear that we have limited space that the town owns at this point. And so I'm not necessarily asking if you've come to a resolution about all that, but more, are you discussing it? And is there anything at this point you would like to share with the committee? Uh, the great. Way, the funds for moving are in 
the capital budget. They're not in the operating budget. However, the operating budget for next year will begin to reflect what it's going to be to operate, but not out of the main library. So awesome questions. Uh, um, so, so many questions. So yes, uh, uh, we have we have feelers out into the town. Uh, we know that most likely the space is plural that will be located in uh, during the two years will probably not be town owned. Um, and so yes, we, we have a budget for you know, a rent or a lease or whatever it is, uh, as well as the moving. Um, so that that will be taken care of um, regarding, you know, the, the storage. So with the exception of our special collections department, which, which will have will need its own special space for storage, for the most part, um, our what we're going to bring. Let me back up. Contractually, we have to, uh, we will be providing full library services during these two years. So it, it, if we have books in our regular collection that could be boxed up and, and, and kept in a storage bunker somewhere, you know, and not being used for two years, it probably doesn't belong in our collection. So the moral of the story is our collection is going to be on shelves and available to people wherever it is that we end up. Um, and but yes, absolutely the branches. So that'll be that's that'll be number one. We'll be able to use both the north and the south for programming, IT staffing, um, collections, and we will, you know, increase the open hours for both of the branches. Um, you know, and the, the North Amherst Library, Paul will have to talk about that more. So whenever that's available to us, we'll be able to use that. Um, I think I think that's everything, Lynn. Was that everything? Yeah. And, okay. and I'll just jump in the um, on the, the, sh the sheet that showed the timeline for everything. The bottom line was the finding new space. So there's a, there's a time schedule for finding space, the interim space that we'll need. So that's factored in. Thank you. Kathy? Um, well, Lynn, you opened up an area. So I'll just add the question. Um, the North Amherst Library, because of a generous donor, is due to be larger with one of the key spaces that everyone's been looking forward to as a community room. Are you potentially talking about putting librarians and shelving in the community room so there wouldn't be a community room when the library opens in terms of ability for the community to meet, as opposed to the part of the library that's the library right now? And if there's not an answer to that right now, I just, at some point, it would be nice to uh, be part of that discussion. So uh, so this is the North Amherst Library Project is really not a library project. It's a town project. And, and um, the library space is actually getting smaller uh, due to handicapped accessibility issues and all of that. So uh, the library's losing space. So that being said, you know, Paul and I and Guilford and Cindy, uh, branch staff, we've worked really closely on this project. And um, as, as Paul has said, and, and he can definitely answer better, but he has said, you know, the Jones Library is an important town department. And if we have town spaces that can help out another town, you know, uh, a service, then we will do that. So how, what that looks like, we haven't gotten into those specifics. In, in my mind, I would love to leave it as a meeting room and be able to use it for library programming as opposed to additional collection space. But it uh, so much of it will depend on what kind of interim spaces we can find, you know, what's available and, and that kind of thing. So it's not it's not my goal to take over the space, but I just don't know yet. Paul, you want to say more? No, I think you said it right. It, it is you know we will look at every town space to to um, make sure costs are, are set aside. And but you, as you all know, town space is at a premium. Uh, there's a lot of demand on on town space, but the first priority always is for town departments um, because that's what we have municipal buildings for. Um, so if we can make a space available to the to the Jones Library for a period of time. Um, 
but we also have other needs that are competing at the same time. We do need meeting spaces. We need community spaces. We so those are also high priorities. It's not so. It's, we're you know again we're in the sort of um, we have about I know six months or something to be talking about these types of options. So, uh, are there questions about the operating budget itself that um, I know that uh, Bernie and Post questions and that we've got good, great answers, which we appreciate. Are there other questions from the committee or the council? I don't have any questions, but Sharon's showing us the questions, I think is the first time I saw them. So if we could get that presentation, it would be great just to put it as part of the packet with the list of questions in it. Um, it's, a, it's in the packet and on um, SharePoint, I put it in there. Um, okay, so it's, yeah. it's in there now. Okay, yeah. thank you, Sean. Okay. Um, anything else uh, that people want to ask regarding library budget? This is our chance, Lynn. Yeah, I, I cannot resist taking the moment to say when we passed the motion to allow the borrowing for the library, we were very clear that that was all the town was going to put forward. Everything Sharon has said reflects that. I just want to make sure that the new counselors understand that that's still the understanding. Okay. And Sharon, thank you for all your hard work. And Bob, uh, for you and all the trustees, you're, you're really going at it. Thanks. Thank you all so much. And definitely, thank you, Bob. Okay. So, um, Sharon and Bob, thank you very much for the presentation. As I said uh, to Mike and uh, Allison afterwards, when we get into the discussion of um, what we're, our recommendations are going to be, if they're last minute questions, we will pose them. It's not with the thought that you would actually come back to the committee to another meeting, uh, though we'd always welcome to see you again, but just if we have questions that gives you, uh, we'd appreciate uh, being able to do that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, you guys. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you. Are we, uh, let me see if I can turn to Sean for a second. Are we ready to move along to the recreation department budget? Yeah, so let me see. Um, Marion, are, are you there? Yes, sorry, I am here. Is um is we're a little ahead of schedule. Is yeah. Ray able to um join? Yeah, yeah, I can let him know that we are okay. ready to Thank go. You. All right, sure. So Andy, maybe if people want to take a five minute break, it's up, up to you all. Um, because we're gonna go probably a little bit past eleven. We could do that, or we could just wait for Ray to join. Um, is there anything that people? Is there a desire to take a break uh, for five minutes? No, okay. Well, no, that's good. <laughs> um, I uh, just to, so we can get to this uh, now and not have to do it later. Um, previewing next week, I did want to mention one thing to the committee, and that is that it turns out that I'm going to have a, a conflict per, on a personal level due to. to a medical appointment in Northampton on Thursday of next week. And um, I will be at most of the meeting, but some of the meeting I uh, will be participating uh, literally uh, by cell phone in the car. And as a result, um, I have asked our vice chair, Kathy, to chair next Thursday's meeting, which is the meeting that will be about uh, Department of Public Works and the enterprise funds that are overseen by TPW administration. And uh, I will uh, convene the meeting and then turn it over to Kathy and she is going to run the meeting um, in its entirety. Um, so I just wanted to uh, 
let you all know of that plan. Matt, um, I see you have your hand up. So. Oh, well, first of all, you know, obviously best wishes for, for um, your appointment, but I did want to say that you reminded me, I was going to tell, tell you by email that I have jury duty on um, Thursday. So that I'll have to excuse myself as well. And hopefully that'll be the one um, meeting that I miss for that, for that reason. Well, if, if you want, but, Matt, we can give the court a call and just explain that, um, you know, finance committee's coming up and, you know, you might need to be recused. So. I could tell him I know, I know Sean Mangano. I'm sure that'll get me off the hook. Not me, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, good luck with the jury duty. And I hope that it is a, uh, in, indeed a one day commitment on your part. So, um, so Andy, Ray's here. And I just wanted to quickly say that um, for people who are following along in the budget book, now we're starting to get into the departments that are in the budget book, the library and schools, they have their own documents. Um, but recreation starts on page 186. Um, as you know, if you want to follow along, um, there's a recreation and then Cherry Hill and then or pools and then Cherry Hill. Okay. So um, Ray, uh, on behalf of the council and the committee, I first of all, I want to welcome you to, um, it says pleasure to meet you for the first time for all of us, or most of us, I think. Likewise. And, uh, um, we hope that uh, things are settling in well for you in your new position, and uh, I'd like to offer you an opportunity to give an overview uh, five, 10 minutes or so of the department and the budget that you're present, that is being presented to us for recreation, uh, particular challenges you see right now, however you want to structure it. Hey, thank you. And thank you all for being here. Uh, um, I guess I can introduce by first, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, our first run through here, Amherst Recreation, with a new name and a lot of new faces and new places. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we're, we're feeling our way through this a little bit. Uh, it's a good time for us to be in the position where we are, where we're, where we're uh, 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 looking at our role and looking at what the community needs here. Uh, our numbers reflect the time that we're in and certainly our, uh, the, the spirit of our office does the same. Uh, I would like to say that with, with this new time, we have, uh, you know, our numbers are starting to look a little bit more normal right now. Uh, if you come into the office, come into our programs right now, we're starting to feel a little bit more normal for the, what's, what's in the budget and what's reflected in our last year, two years is uh, probably as much as any department in the town, we have, uh, we have a, a, a change in our, in our activity. There's a lot of uh, uh, that. A lot of our work is is public facing. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time interacting with the with the public that wasn't there for the last couple of years, and so our service numbers are going to look a lot different from what they have in the past. Uh, right now, our aquatics program, which is a major part of our programming, is moving back towards numbers that are that are recognizable and familiar. Our youth sports numbers, which are probably are, are almost certainly our our strongest, most most uh, 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 it had that the one the, the, the part the area of our department that has the most activity. Our youth sports is back, and we're actually adding more youth sports to our to our agenda. Our after school program is back, looking like it like it should, and that of course was shuttered for the pandemic, as there was no there was no uh, in person school activity for a period of time, and of course Cherry Hill the the piece that uh, that is an outlier for us because it was active during the pandemic for much of the time its numbers actually soared in some ways over the last couple of years but it's looking like their numbers are stabilizing and becoming more normal we've looked at ways to make that work we've lost our theater program. Uh, for a couple of years, and we're, we've already started our conversation about moving that back into the forefront. 
and our adult education, which we which has not been our focus, has diminished and hasn't yet come back to the point where it's where it is uh, you know vibrant and active and active. It hasn't been our focus here for the last year, but our numbers are starting to look much more healthy in each of those first four categories: aquatics, youth, after school, and Cherry Hill. Um, uh, the pandemic numbers dipped. Our mission is to enrich the quality of life for all members of the community by providing the highest level of rec recreational opportunities. Our uh, pandemic numbers dipped and that challenged us to be able to get those back up. But through that pandemic, I think consistent through our, through our, our uh, budget pages uh, is a sense that we felt like we were uh, providing a different service during a time, an important service during a time where the town needed it. And now our, our goal moves towards uh, it accelerates in the area which we've been thinking about since I took over uh, of turning this new energy, this new uh, uh, emergence from the pandemic, turning that into revenue. Uh, our, our major focus now is in turning these numbers and, and adding and being creative about adding uh, revenue numbers to the piece that I think is one of our budget wise is one of our, our greatest services to the town. Uh, is is getting people active for our sake, for their sake, but also in trying to find a way to to uh, uh, create some revenue to keep these programs floating, so we can keep on doing what we're doing, and the town can keep on doing what it's doing. So, uh, in general, I think I think it's been a successful year as we've steered our way out of the muck, um, and and so uh, with that, I guess that's that's my piece that I wanted to share. Uh, I can, I have Marion Jordan here with me, who is my operations director. Uh, uh, she has been, she's a sense of, of historical reference for me and my department. She's been here for a little while and she's been, she's been programming at different levels. She's new in the, in the chair of operations director, but she has a, a has an extensive understanding of how we do our programming from her time and registration. And so Mary and I would be happy to field any questions that you have at this point. Thank you. Um, appreciate the introduction. And um, I want to ask Alicia, uh, we, since she was the one who had taken on looking at the budget on behalf of the committee, whether you have any initial questions. Alicia? Okay, well, let me then um, uh, start with a couple of things. One is um, you mentioned adult education is the recreation. I know that you've gone through some strategic planning work before you were uh, came on board, Ray, uh, with the Recreation Commission, which actually led for the change from being leisure services and supplemental education to being a recreation department is the commitment to adult education actually diminished in the core purposes for the recreation department going forward have you adjusted your planning for that element of the previous work i don't believe that that it has diminished in the focus. Uh, the numbers have been way down for the class. We've had, we've had some classes that have sort of moved and stayed through the pandemic. We have a Qigong class that has been, uh, that's sort of been looking for a home as, as we've been, certainly in my months here, we have a Qigong class. Uh, uh, we have uh, sort of a community dance class that, that, that we've, uh, that we've been, uh, uh, keeping on the on the records here we we haven't had uh, uh and mary can probably tell you about programming a little bit on that uh, it hasn't moved out of our focus but i think the numbers because the numbers have been so low it hasn't been a priority as we've as we've uh gotten to this stage um i'll just jump in for a moment to address that question so um, during, during the time when I first arrived pre-pandemic, there were already diminished numbers. There were really only two very solidly attended and um, 
you know, very committed members who would come to our yoga class that used to be at the Munson and also Qigong. Um, during the pandemic, we did try to move towards doing, um, I would say like the virtual fitness trends, like a lot of health clubs and, and other um, people who serve adults did. Um, it was not as popular. We had a, a yoga instructor um, do a Zoom class. We tried uh, doing Facebook Live events, um, but then we just moved to putting stuff on our free formatting because that's really where a lot of people can get those things now. So um, we have a YouTube, we started a YouTube channel at that time and put a bunch of, um, obviously it's free. We haven't monetized YouTube. Uh, to that capacity, um, but there are available videos. And so we're serving in that way, but I think um, a little bit less so in the in the realm of, of adult education. And now, um, as Ray did mention, the focus has been in sports. And so there is growing um, interest and participation in the adult sports, which I know is a slightly different budget, but, um, but serving the same sort of community need where adults you know, would like to be active and involved. I can also say as a unofficial uh, uh, add on to that, uh, one of the first things I, was my probably the first meeting I took when I was here was a meeting with the group that uh, asked for the pickleball courts for CPAC. Uh, and that actually fed uh, when I was my first conversations here uh, were about what we, you know, uh, what we do with our adult education, what we do with our programming and trying to get a sense for what our programming was. And the, the low numbers, the low activity in there had me thinking that what, what we don't do is we haven't had a lot of, of programming that addresses the, the uh, you know, we have a lot of our energy towards the youth and a lot of energy towards the youth sports. Is there something that we can do? This was a chance for me to uh, sort of commit to finding a way to support that because it allows us to potentially expand our adult programming, our adult educational programming, our adult activity programming. And so uh, one of the reasons why I supported that separate, uh, that separate issue is because I, I thought that that gave us a chance to uh, strengthen what I thought was staggering a little bit. Why call on people or? <laughs> No, that's helpful. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, recognize Kathy and turn the meeting over to her for so I'm going to step away for just a second and I'll be right back. But Kathy, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ray and um, Marion for joining us. And uh, the first thing I want to say is you run terrific programs and they're, they're, they're really appreciated by everyone who use them. My, my kids are now have well aged out of the youth programs, but they were regular <laughs> users of them. So I, I have just a couple of questions and one I should know the answer to. So Sean, when I try to look at the revenues for the program, I'm going to the revolving funds and I, I just didn't know where I see the revenues for the golf course. You know, I can see expenses on each. So that's just a question on where I find it. But in, in thinking of, of opportunities as you're moving forward on adult, CPAC has approved uh, pickleball courts, and it's the ardent hope of those of us who live in North Amherst that they will be at Mill River, which is where they had originally been thought of. And so I do you anticipate, um, I think there's an interest in learning pickleball, as well as a cross-age interest in learning tennis. And I don't know whether we I think you at one point offered some tennis um, in the summer programs, but pickleball will be more a multi-season just by its nature. It, it does pretty well until you get snow and ice on the ground. Um, tennis does pretty well too, um, but it's it, you slip on leaves. So it's just a thinking of, of where you're going in the future. And then on the golf course, I was, as you know, Ray, I was on when we talked about the golf course equipment, I, yes. think there's an op I think there's an opportunity for youth programs on the golf course, and I would range them from zero cost to very small entrance fees. And I don't know whether there are families who could uh, donate 
youth sized golf clubs because what I've observed is people go out in the golf course and just whack with the club. You know, it's not necessarily they're becoming golfers, <laughs> but it's just fun. And families with kids could be using that, you know, even if they're doing it. So just trying to think of where there are um, uh, uh, in, engaging the schools um, and or others going forward. And I, I personally think that this whole range of activities is good for the town. So I'm not always looking for the fees to cover the expenses. Um, you know, I, I think it's something that we do. And that's that's it, um, you know. And I'm not supposed to tread tread over into capital, but in walking past the War Memorial Pool area, I saw these basketball courts that um, I'm thinking of inner city courts that looked a whole lot better than what I saw there, where there were ripped nets, the the backboard was falling apart, and there were holes. So you, I don't think you could bounce or shoot the ball easily. But there are three. It's a nice little youth area where kids who weren't professional basketball players would be out there shooting hoops. So just trying to think of where um, small amounts of money, on, and I think there's a lot of support in town for all of this, and I'll stop. So it was more on the, the revenue side and the opportunities looking forward with um, racket sports. Ray, do you, do you want me to start with the overview of how the funds work, um, or do you want to go ahead? Excuse me. Do you want me to? Can I, I'll go ahead yeah. real quick and just so um, so recreation is a little bit confusing. So I'll just do a quick overview. So um, Ray's doing a good job of managing all these different funds essentially. So the recreation um, budget is in the general fund. Ray manages three revolving funds um, that are separate from the general fund budget that's in front of you. Um, and they're and they're listed in the budget document um, further down in, in a section specifically labeled revolving funds. Um, so he manages an adult education revolving fund, a um, after school revolving fund, and then I think just a general uh, recreation pr uh, program revolving fund that does all the other programs. So that's where you'll see the revenues and the expenses coming in for those programs. And those are the ones they have to balance each year. So whatever the revenues are, whatever the expenses are, there have to be revenues to support them. Um, a revolving fund can't finish a year with a, with a deficit. Um, within the general fund budget though, there's, there's the recreation admin, um, there's the Cherry Hill budget, and then there's the pool budget. So those aren't revolving funds. Those are just like any other department. Um, so Cherry Hill, when Cherry Hill does really well, its revenues are on the general fund side. So it doesn't actually doesn't actually benefit Cherry Hill directly, it benefits the whole town um, when Cherry Hill does really well because those are general fund revenues. So if they beat what we budgeted, that just goes into supporting the overall revenue picture. Um, and likewise on the expense side, there's an expense budget for Cherry Hill and the general fund um, and they have to stick within that expense budget. Thank you. Okay, Michelle. And then I, think, I think Anna was ahead of me, but you can go ahead, Michelle. Okay, thanks. Nice to meet you, Ray. I don't, I'm not sure that we've ever met. And also you, Marion, thank you. Um, I had a question. I'm actually looking at the budget book, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, and we've had a conversation um, about the recreations department's plan to um, do a needs assessment for a youth empowerment center. Um, and a feasibility uh, analysis. And I was just wondering if you could give us any sort of update or feedback on that and where that's at. I can, I'm gonna ask Sean to support me on exactly where the, the next, we're basically at a, at, a, at a fork right now, a little bit of a miniature fork as we start moving through it. We started in earnest uh, about a month ago in doing needs assessment and gathering information. I believe that it's important for us. This is not uh, uh, my, my, own, my own personal uh, feeling is that I would love to, as the recreation director, have that tied into my recreation department, uh, have it tied into our services and what we're doing and what we intend to do. I think it, I think it uh, helps my department, help the town. Uh, uh, don't know for sure that that's where it ends up. Uh, our, but we did 
accept the responsibility of, of putting this needs assessment out, gathering the information to see just what the Functioning Youth Empowerment Center would look like in connection with all the different intentions of the town, with all the different, uh, the, the different identified areas where there might be need. I thought that we would be in a really good position to, to uh, ask the questions, gather the information and present to the town the findings because a lot of the needs are in our area. Not all of them, but a lot of the needs are in our area. Yeah. Uh, the, the place where we're shifting right now is, you know, there's some interest in, in turning that needs assessment to, like, I think there's, there's, there's some sense that we want to try and get this, uh, this in place. We want to make something happen here right now. I still believe that we need to, uh, you know, uh, do our due diligence and, and gather the information to find out exactly the, in, in my vision, it's going to be something that is bigger than just implementing a, 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 a program right now on what we think our needs are. I think it involves a lot of interaction with the town before we can make that happen. Uh, and so, so uh, there's a little bit of a veer right now. We veered a little bit in terms of wh how we're conducting that, that needs assessment, but uh, we are still in, we're still very much earnest in that stage of gathering information to see where and what that youth empowerment center looks like. Uh, some of it will support our department, whether it's whether it's my department that runs it or runs in cooperation with it or what have you. Uh, some of it will be will be recreational interest. Some of it, if we do this well, if we meaning the town does this well. It will be looking at social services. It'll be looking at, at issues of, of access and equity. It'll be looking at, at issues of, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of different interests that are involved and a lot of different, different uh, uh, parts of the town that'll be pulled into this. Uh, it's not a recreation. Uh, uh, I don't believe that it's a recreation task. I think that we are right now and responsible. I'm responsible for putting together that assessment that we'll, we'll find out just how deep it goes into the town. But uh, yeah, I do think that we need to uh, be, be uh, acting ourselves to the town interest and find out what that, what that need is. Thank you so much, Ray. That's really, really helpful. Is it okay if I add to that real quick too? Um, I think, uh, uh, the counselors know that one of the goals for the town manager is to make recommendations on the recommendations from the CSWG. So um, Ray and I and um, the town manager and the assistant town manager, um, there will be an update going to the council soon in terms of the plan forward on this recommendation um, and thoughts on how to proceed um, uh, with some you know, thoughts around timeline and how to involve stakeholders um, in the process. Yeah, and I just if I could just add to that, I mean, I want to recognize Ray and Marion are both new and they're relatively new in their positions, and they've taken this on in addition, which I'm really proud of. And uh, Ray said exactly what we've been thinking about, and um, he, he's the right person. And, and as we start to look at this in a more um, organized way about how are we really moving forward on this, uh, that's Ray articulated precisely the kind of conversation that we need to have. Thank you. I don't know. Um, I'm happy to ask mine, but if Alicia's hand is up for something related to that, it might make more sense for her to go first. Mine's unrelated to, the, to that yeah. question. Okay. Alicia's, are you following up? Um, yeah, thank you. And sorry, because I have kiddos here in the background. I don't want to say too much. I just wanted to say, like, thank you, Ray, for the um, update. And I have a lot more questions that I don't want to take up everyone's time with. So I was just wondering. Um, if there would be another time to revisit this. Um, uh, would there be another time for me to follow up with you? Yeah, or for all of us to revisit the conversation just specifically around the, um, the needs assessment for the Youth Empowerment Center. Because I, I, I don't have like budget related necessarily questions for it. So I don't want to take up the time right now, but I, I do have like a lot of questions about that. And so I wanted to know if there will be another time where we all see. be talking about this. Thank you. Yes, I can certainly make myself available. Uh, 
uh, for follow up. Certainly, as we, as Sean said, uh, we're going to be sending out a new, you know, basically an update as as where we are. Maybe some of those questions get answered by by that. But I'm certainly always available uh, for anybody that has questions one on one. Can call me, or if we, if you want to set up another time, uh, yeah, I certainly can make myself available. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we uh, should, to the greatest extent we can, uh, stay with the fact that this is about the budget and the budget proposal. Uh, Anna? Okay, so um, hi, Ray, um, and hi, Marion. So the I'm trying to get an understanding, and I apologize if this is something that I should have been able to deduce um, and, and missed, that's, that's on me. Uh, the 30,000 to partially restore the extra help budget at Cherry Hill. Something that um, came to, that a resident had brought up to me was that, you know, if our goal is to make Cherry Hill uh, self-sufficient, we need to make sure it's staffed at all hours that it's open and not let people just walk on without paying to use it. And so I'm curious if the 30,000 will allow that. I mean, I see it's open eight to six every day. Does that mean that it is staffed eight to six every day? And that everyone who's going on it is is paying for their tea time, um, and and I've twenty thousand follow up questions in terms of of equity of access later on. But in terms of this budget right now, does that thirty thousand make it so that you have someone staffing and collecting fees or confirming that people booked online ahead of time? And if so, what do you anticipate the revenue shift to be from that uh, from that increased staffing? Thank you. Great question, thank you. Um, the 30,000 for historical background for people who maybe aren't aware or, or uh, if it wasn't clear in the document, 30,000, we, uh, our staff was moved to Cherry Hill to keep them, keep them whole and active during the pandemic. Uh, so we, we lost our part-time help during that period of time. And it's been, uh, uh, Thank you to the to Sean and his team for being creative and finding ways to uh, to 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 not let us suffer this year as we didn't have that line put back in and we had to try and figure out a way to to run that club uh, without that thirty thousand. That thirty thousand uh, basically is the staff help. Uh, the historical background is that that basically allows us to have it staffed at all. Um, now that our staff is back in the recreation department doing our own work that had been shuttered during the pandemic. Uh, uh, to answer the bigger question there, yes, one of our goals is to, uh, has been over the course of the last few months of preparing for this golf season, and then certainly in the months that we've, that we've been operating is to close any leaks that happen uh, in terms of people uh, sneaking on or or having uh, tea times people people basically getting in rounds for free however it may happen uh, 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 that are that are basically being uncharged for services uh, yes uh, we have somebody on the door we have somebody on the clubhouse at all hours that they're open um, and part of it is, because that's what you do when you're when you're running a, when you're running operations. Part of that is also because because we want to make sure that there's accountability on that, as that is a a large a community community uh, uh, a recreational uh, opportunity. This is something that we that we feel it's our responsibility to the community for. Um, how does how does we're trying to make sure that all areas of a pretty people don't golf for the opportunity to have more rules thrown at them and more like we don't want to be be uh, sort of sort of tight when when people go out and golf and have police state sort of stuff but we we are trying to make sure that every place where where uh, we're offering a service is accounted for and Marion is being a main architect of that. I, I'll let her uh, add or, or correct anything in that. No, that was that was uh, well said. Yeah, what we are trying to tighten up on is um, 
making sure that because we have staff up there doesn't just mean that <laughs> that it's going to go perfectly. So we're trying to do um, a better job in categorizing and keeping things clear so that um, as they're trained and getting better at their jobs, that they're able to um, not just you know, sit there and sell them a beer afterwards, but to make sure that they understand how to use the system. So it is a little bit of retraining people because there are people that have been members or have just played there for a long time. And I do know I'm from Amherst. There historically has been, a, you know, it's kind of a college course sometimes and people haven't always been the most upfront with, um, you know, making sure that they're treating things respectfully and that kind of thing. Um, so we're trying very, very hard to, tighten up in that sense um, and make sure that people are, you know, doing all the things they should following the etiquette. It is a golf course still. Um, so that's something we've been trying to do. And then the, the point of sale system that we're using um, is pretty user-friendly. It's, it's not necessarily its intended design, but it's doing the job. <laughs> so, yeah. Can I ask a quick follow-up, Andy? Sure. So, so you mentioned this, Mary, and I think so one of the points where I imagine you all would make your money, some money would be on sales of alcohol at the club. And so do you, when you say it's staffed, is that portion staffed? Um, yes. Like, is it staffed on all fronts or are there, is it ever only staffed kind of like someone only maintaining the course or anything like that? So as far as maintenance and um, clubhouse operations, they function pretty separately of one another. Um, and so clubhouse staff really have the responsibility of checking folks in, making sure they're paying, you know, selling them a beer or giving them a cart or whatever else, um, you know, they would need to do and actually take, you know, cash handling type of skills would be required. But as far as um, understanding how to play and making sure people are, you know, being respectful of the grounds, that's a separate, um, separate group of people that are there. And I don't raise that something that we're staffing all the time. I'm not sure where we have been on that because I've only been part of those conversations, but. No, thank you. That answers. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. And I want to thank um, Anna and Alicia and others for bringing up uh, these are important questions. And also, I confess, I do not fully understand the um, revenue expense, uh, you know, function within this budget. I need to probably spend a little bit more time studying it and listening to um, to you all. But but Ray and Marion and others, thank you so much for, for the work you do. And I just want to make a general statement as, you know, with, with young kids um, around the importance of the rec department um, for, you know, just for the lifeblood of our, of our town. Um, from a, you know, from a cultural perspective, but also cultural equity and, and a growth perspective. You know, I think that um, so, some, sometimes you kind of pass over information that comes from the rec department as being, uh, you know, kind of background noise if it's not directly impacting you. But, but I will definitely say that, you know, uh, we've identified having, you know, first time home, home ownership as being, uh, you know, a long-term goal towards the economic health and prosperity of the, of the town. And I really think that things like a vibrant um, rec department that has a lot of opportunities for young families and, and you know, for all, for all, but especially for young families is really essential to that strategy and something that, um, you know, I'll always find a way to support however I can. Um, as long as you keep that waiting pole open a little bit longer this summer, that's my only, <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Um, you guys, you guys are doing a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. So I, um, Linda, you had a, uh, I don't see Paul, do you have something you want to say? Yeah, I only wanted to say very quickly, I liked your new brochure, saves paper, oh, and was very clear. Thank you so much. That's, that's a thank you to Marion Jordan. That's a lot of hard work that Marion put in for that. Thank you. And Andy, I just want to put a plug in there. They're doing, so Ray is really a good collaborator. He's working with Earl Miller, with Cress, and with uh, Haley Bolton, our new senior director. And Haley and Ray put together a, uh, a pool party uh, movie that's coming up this summer, a series of movies where you can bring your floaties, sit, sit in the pool, watch a movie. It's, it's, and they're so, they're so pumped about it. It's really fun to hear. Yeah, we're, we're going to put the, the movie screen on that horrible basketball court that was just mentioned. <laughs> um, we're we're going we're gonna to throw it up over there. So 
So we'll actually get some use out of a court that has no basic use right now. Kevin. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to echo what Matt just said. I just think this is a, a huge service and a reason, one of the reasons you want to live in Amherst. Um, and I, for one, I actually don't think the golf course has to actually balance its budget, but in finding the revenues, Sean, on page, I think it's page 61, and then I had to find the expenses back on page 196. It's kind of balanced right now. You know, we don't expect the pool to balance its budget. The pool, we operate a pool so people can swim. And one of the things I, you know, this idea of potential revenues of the clubhouse, if it could serve beer, I think, I think it's all great because I think it makes a community center. And at one point we thought, could we winterize the clubhouse? So when people are sledding, they could come in and buy hot cocoa. You know, I mean, it, the same thing. It's just, a, it's an activity. It's a recreation area. So I think that the brochure was fabulous. Um, you know, I looked at looked at it and said it's so nice and short compared to what I used to get. And but I could figure out exactly because you how to get in to more information. So I thought that was really great too. So thank you very much. It's a it's a, it's an exciting set of programs you're running. Thank you. So I had a couple of questions. Um, one was. Uh, Summer hiring is, uh, have you been facing challenges this year? That's an exclamation point. Yes, we've been facing challenges. Uh, uh, the, the pretty much all of our programs are right now still looking. Uh, I have faith that we'll be able to sort it out, especially as, as we get through this finals period and we get through, you know, high school kids you know, wanting to transition to where they're going. Uh, we are, we're struggling. I mean, there's a, uh, you know, I, I saw in the budget, uh, the, 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 uh, the note about minimum wage going up, that's going to help. That's going to help certainly uh, some for us. Uh, uh, I think that trying to compete with other opportunities is something that our aquatic staff, that our camp staff, that, that, uh, uh, you know, you know, all of all of our uh, of our of our summer employees are looking for opportunities that may or may not be working with kids, working with with what have you. And if they're getting paid more than what have you, and if they're getting paid more someplace else, then we might lose them. Um, we are. I think there are certain places where we have opportunities we can give people. I think that part of it. You know, I don't know if if. Uh, right off the bat people are going to come in and say you know it'd be a this is the place for us to be but we are uh you know we're trying to play catch up right now in terms of getting quality staff and getting quality staff that we can trust to do the work that that we're understaffed at the top to be able to do on our own um it's a challenge it's a notable challenge for us uh but like i said i think that we have faith that it'll it'll uh work out in some way in the end, we just aren't there right now. Second question, uh, have we seen a shift uh, as kids are uh, sort of going towards uh, being very involved in their computers and the games that, that there isn't the interest in the kinds of programs that we've historically been running in the recreation field and uh, how that's adjusting our planning and the revolve the whole revolving fund setup that has been in place for so many years anecdotally yes i don't i haven't done the, the any sort of research i haven't collected any data on that uh but i i think the general sense that we had going into our winter Basketball is usually something that that is is people are flowing. Uh, you know, we have an overflow of kids trying to participate in basketball. There was much less interest in basketball this year. Uh, uh, girls sports is way down in terms of participation numbers. Uh, uh, we're we're actively trying to encourage people just to try things out to eliminate some of the game competition. To, to get people involved. I think the numbers are way down 
in terms of participation in a lot of those active sports or active, you know, active anything. Our camp numbers are, I think, relatively uh, relatively stable in terms of people people uh, uh, looking for camp opportunities. Our regular but, summer camps are completely full right now. Okay. Sports camps, not so much. Uh, so I yeah. think that there is some. Uh, it may be a cultural flow. It may be a post-pandemic thing, but there is some hesitance in people to to uh, uh, you know to participate at the same levels that they participated in the past. Uh, it just means that we have to be creative about trying to try to offer opportunities for people. Uh, you know, everything doesn't have to be a sport, a jersey with officials. It doesn't have to be that for us. But we do want to try and encourage people to be involved, involved, healthy, and to connect with people through program programming that we have. Okay, and I have one last question. And Bernie, I see your hand up, so not ignoring you. But my last question is had to do with uh, subsidies because one of the historic ways that uh, we use the town portion of the funding to supplement the revolving funds was to um, have subsidies where income uh, might otherwise be a barrier to participation, which was not consistent with the town's values. Um, is there um, is that goal still being addressed? Do we still have enough money being put into the subsidies to meet that goal? Mary, and take that. Um, yes, right now we have um, well two two different answers, I guess. So for our regular programs that uh, serve families and youth, um, we've been able to use. I'm not sure the exact percentage, I'd have to look that up, but we've been able to use um, a lot of our fee subsidy in as far as after school goes for kids who are participating in our after school program, prime time. Um, we have been able to partner with the school department and some families have been able to go with zero parent fee, which is really, really great um, where they've met us halfway or 60, 40 or what have you. Um, so do we need more? I, I don't know. I guess if participation, you know, if we're hoping anticipation goes up, then conceivably we'd be giving out more fee subsidy um, to allow that. Thank you, Bernie. I, I, think, I think just a quick follow up on that. I think that we can do a better job of advertising for equity's sake, for advertising that, that availability is there. Because I do know that there are some people who don't know who see the price and get priced out uh, and say rec, rec opportunities aren't for me. I've had that conversation with uh, some counselors and with some families. I, I don't know that there is, that, it, that it's always as clear that there, there are opportunities to subsidize activity. And I think our goal is to ensure that a feed is not a barrier to participation, no matter who it is. And so I think we work to make sure that that's always the case. Good, thank you. Bernie? Yeah, um, just real quick thought, on, and because the fees came up, um, I, I would think that if, um, if you phrased it that there is a contribution as opposed to a fee, that might take some of the edge off. Um, um, and uh, because even small chargers can be a barrier um, to, uh, to participation. Uh, Ray said something that really caught my ear when I, I, heard, I heard him say that there might be some de-emphasis of, of the purely competitive nature of, of recreation offerings and that there'd be a broadening of that so that, that uh, people have a chance to have some fun as opposed to necessarily be uh, on, a, on a competitive team. Uh, and, and I think that's important because it broadens the it broadens the vision and it broadens the area. And Ray, I've heard lots of lots of good ideas, lots of prospects. Uh, please do not burn yourself out. Uh, <laughs> and for for uh, for Paul, um, the, uh, the 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 uh, youth empowerment center piece. Uh, my understanding is that's all ARPA money. It's all sort of off budget. Um, I think it's a considerable amount of money. And I would appreciate it if that information that got shared with the counselors 
also got shared with those of us who are uh, citizen members of the finance committee. Thanks. Alicia. Um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, first ag appreciate everything that Bernie just said. I agree with that. Um, and also emphasize something that Ray brought up in terms of the advertisement, because there's really not any place on the rec site or brochure or anywhere that says that you can have a subsidy. Um, not like you can't add things to your cart on the website and then see that you can have a subsidy and all you'll see is like a really huge bill and that would definitely discourage people from being in services. And I also just want to point out because in my personal experience it's difficult when you have multiple children. Um, and so like for one of my kids to do basketball camp is already like $300. And what do I do if all three of my kids want to be in basketball? Um, and if you're thinking about those things in terms of being strategic and how those people with multiple kids can participate in things that are fairly pricey, but that are beneficial. And um, you all do a great job though. We really love your services. So thank you. Jamila. Okay. Are there other questions about the recreation budget? I don't see any coming up and uh, I won't get into swimming pools because that uh, something that becomes a, something that I, I rely on. Uh, Kathy? Did you have anything else or if not, um, then I, I want to um, thank you both. Uh, Ray, thank you for being here and um, for your uh, very good presentation and being so open to answering questions and Marion also. So, thank you um, much. Thank you. so I think that uh, we're getting on towards our time and we need to uh, conclude. Um, there's, I th think, one member of the public here. And if uh, you wish to offer any comment, you're welcome to do so. And uh, just raise your hand and uh, we will bring you into the room and allow for so that you can uh, use the public comment opportunity. Um, so uh, I think we uh, need to bring Jemai Mills into the room if we can and uh go ahead please uh give us your yes. name and tell us uh and make, yeah make your comment hi this is uh lauren mills actually that's my son's name um i live in south amherst and i am on the board of um the board of health and um i'm surprised i'm the only one in the audience today but um i just uh, wanted to make comment and some notes about um, the issue and the um, the Amherst Rec and Recreation for Youth um, that was just um, discussed. And there was a, a comment made earlier in in that presentation about you know comparing a basketball court, um, the ones that are unkept um, in the high in front of the high school, and comparing that to urban courts. And it kind of, um, I guess, just uh, made me think that um, making those kinds of comparisons, you know, of what is normal and accepted and, you know, what is not acceptable in other neighborhoods is just, it really hit home to me that um, with um, communities of color, sometimes we just accept certain things that should be unacceptable. Um, and for the Amherst rec, their assessment, I would really like to know how the public is being uh, brought in and included into that, um, that assessment, because as I've stated in other community meetings that, um, you know, children who live in um, affordable housing complex, like um, myself and my three children. Um, we have the space and the, um, the, the basketball courts here and so forth, but there's not a lot of organized um, activities for the youth. And there's a lot of uh, 
you know, free time that they have after school if they don't go to an after school program. And I just see that, you know, as a precaution, as, you know, a um, preventive measure that there should be more creative thought about how AMPAS Rec reaches out to um, communities of color. And um, it would just be nice to like have the monies that were put toward ARPA to be, um, to be used to have more creative and new initiatives to reach these, these youth. And um, I'm sorry if I'm, you know, stumbling a little bit, but I think it's also important for the council to realize that um, sometimes parents of color have to like say things five or more times to really be heard. Um, and that's not always the case for others in the Amherst community. So I just would like to share as a parent again, and someone who is really, you know, trying to make sure that the youth are not, you know, being forgotten in the whole, you know, allocations of opera funds and, um, and, and other funding is that, you know, the, the Amherst Rec and their their assessments and their new initiatives really be um, including including like a, a way to really reach out to the youth, which would also perhaps be um, also um, transportation tra transportation as a way to to and allow more youth to like get to these um, activities. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that. It would be nice to see Amherst Rec if they're going to be involved in the the um, youth empowerment um, project, whatever that project ends up looking like. Is that they they come to where the youth are, and then also they allow the youth a way to get to um, these activities that they're in charge of. Thank you so much. And thank you. That was very helpful and appreciated. Uh, Sean, did you have anything you want to, because we need to conclude. Yeah, I know we don't normally respond to public comment, but I just want to thank Miss Mills. Um, she was one of the few people who uh, provided a lot of input during the ARPA listening sessions. Um, and that input contributed to one of the allocations that we set aside for um, the recreation department to do some of the things that she described. So again, I just wanna thank her for the input that she sh um, shared um, and for, for working with us during that process. Yeah, um, so as, uh, seeing the other hands, I wanted, um, Again, thank Ms. Mills for her comments today. I, and again, enough, Ray, if you have any concluding thoughts and, um, in response. And, and otherwise, I think we can conclude the meeting with just uh, some preview of next week. No, I, I'm, I'm OK. I, I would just like to thank everybody again for the opportunity. Uh, uh, this was. This was a, 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 a good first experience for me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm standing up right now and, and able, able to walk out of here uh, feeling like I can't wait to get to the next one. So this, oh. this budget stuff is fun. See, Sean, some people think the budgets are fun. <laughs> uh, so um, we know we have our um, goal set up for next week. Um, I think that uh, in we've, Tuesday meeting is going to focus on public safety, including CRESS. And uh, so it's going to be a, a very interesting meeting. If everybody knows who the assignments are, I think Kathy has a large role in um, framing questions to begin that discussion. And uh, we talked about Thursday, which is uh, going to be in public works and public work related enterprise funds, which is a meeting that Kathy's actually going to be the chair of. 
So that is uh, next week's preview. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say, and then I'll see if anybody else has any concluding comments from the committee, is that um, I have started work on a report to um, for the council packet on Monday, and I will try and get a draft out to you um, this evening with it. It is not going to be long. It needs to focus on two things. One is it's a uh, cover to provide the third quarter report, which we were presented to last week about um, the third quarter and to give some context to it so that um, because there was a lot of good discussion that I'm trying to reflect in the draft, which has been the major challenge. The other thing that we need to do, in, including the report, is about the um, uh, water and sewer rates, because we did vote the water and sewer rate, and that needs to be included in the report. I will make reference in the draft to um, the process that we're engaged in now, but point out that we do not um, summarize our discussions um, until we have recommendations at the end of the process. And um, I'm counting on all of the committee members who have sections that they've been assigned to, to help with the draft in those sections that um, fit within their areas. So that's kind of where I can conclude it. And I don't know if there's anything else from the committee. So I um, just pause for one moment to see if there's anybody who raises hands. And if not, uh, going once, going twice. Um, Lynn, do you need to adjourn the council meeting before I adjourn the finance committee? I do. Uh, I am adjourning the council meeting at 1154. And I am adjourning the finance committee meeting at the same time. So thank you. And have a good, we'll see you on Tuesday.